started. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's hybrid New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Aging jointly with women and gender equity. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions upon speaking, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Okay, good morning. Happy Pride. <laughs> my name is Crystal Hudson and my pronouns are she, her. I'm the chair of the Committee on Aging and proud to be co-chair of the LGBTQIA plus caucus with my colleague, Chair Caban. I'd like to thank Ch Chair Caban as well as the committee members from the Aging Committee and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for coming together to hold this morning's hearing. Today, I'm proud that the committees are creating space for the council's first ever hearing focusing on LGBTQIA plus older adults. As a black, queer, masculine of center woman living in the city with the largest population of LGBTQIA plus adults in the country, I believe it is critical that we give our LGBTQIA plus older adults the attention and the resources they need to age with dignity, and that we advance policies that center and uplift this population, especially those of color. In a period where LGBTQIA plus people and most acutely our transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary communities face rampant discrimination in this country and live in fear of being attacked just for existing, we must ensure that we are doing all we can as the people who hold power to make New York City a safe, comfortable, and affirming environment for LGBTQIA plus adults to age with dignity and without fear. New York City is home to over 700,000 LGBTQIA plus people, and it is estimated that almost 200,000 out of this population are over the age of 50. As New York City's general population ages, so will our LGBTQIA plus population, and we need to be ready with the resources and competencies to serve them. Many LGBTQIA plus older adults have experienced discrimination throughout their lives, and the cumulative effect of this discrimination stigma and living with unequal and discriminatory laws and policies is that LGBTQIA plus older adults face unique challenges as they age. These unique challenges demand unique solutions. Unfortunately, this population remains largely invisible and the city collects almost no data specifically about LGBTQIA plus older adults. That's why I'm introducing legislation with Chair Caban to create a commission of experts within DIFTA to identify challenges, share best practices, and develop recommendations on ways to improve the quality of life of LGBTQIA plus older adults in our city. I hope that we can discuss this proposal in other ways that DIFTA can collect and use data to better serve our LGBTQIA plus elders. I also want to highlight that June is Elder Abuse Awareness Month. Elder abuse is an issue that disproportionately impacts LGBTQIA plus older adults. Elder abuse can be financial, physical, emotional, and include neglect. Compared to their non-LGBTQIA plus peers, LGBTQIA plus older adults are more likely to live alone, less likely to be partnered, less likely to have children, and they experience higher rates of loneliness and isolation. These are well-known risk factors for elder abuse. LGBTQIA plus older adults may fail to seek help because they fear revealing their sexual orientation or identity. I hope to hear more on what DIFTA is doing to assist those victims of elder abuse and whether we can take further steps to ensure that such assistance is sufficiently sensitive to their needs. There's a lot of ground to cover with this topic, and so I want to say thank you to the advocates and members of the public who are joining us today to educate us and shine a light on this population. I especially want to thank SAGE and Grio Circle for the remarkable and invaluable work they do in District 35 for LGBTQIA plus older adults. Thank you to representatives from, from the administration for joining us. I look forward to hearing from you on what you're doing to support our aging LGBTQIA plus population and what is possible moving forward. 
I would also like to thank my staff, Casey Addison and Andrew Wright, and aging committee staff, Christopher Pepe, Chloe Rivera, and Daniel Krupp. Uh, I believe Chair Caban is Okay, so uh, Chair Caban has given me permission to share that she's not present physically. Oh, I'm, and I'm here, I can also share with folks actually since there's quorum. Okay, great, so I was just gonna say. Sorry. Uh, be, that's okay, because we have um, quorum, Chair Caban will be joining us virtually, but before she gives her opening remarks, I do just want to acknowledge the council members who are present, uh, Council Member Althea Stevens, Council Member Chris Marte, Council Member Kristen Richardson Jordan, and Council Member Lynn Schulman. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, and I, I am attending virtually, as, as you all can see. Thank you to my fellow chair, um, Chair Hudson. And just like a, an added, I always want to give thanks to the, the staff and committee members, but just an added uh, layer of gratitude because we have been scrambling a lot leading up to this morning. Um, and before I give my opening statement, on this hearing that I am very, very proud that we are, are, are doing here today, because it's incredibly important. I just wanna share some information with folks. Uh, I am uh, participating virtually for this hearing because I tested positive for COVID over the weekend. The pandemic is still raging. Thankfully, I am experiencing mild symptoms. And so it allows me to, to still work from home, although a little, a little winded, so I might keep my, um, remarks short, but I wanted to share with you how this will work. I think that my constituents deserve to know, um, residents of New York City deserve to know. So state law basically requires that in order for me to participate in this hearing virtually, there has to be an in-person quorum of the members of the committee present. So it is conceivable that at some point during this hearing, I will no longer under law be able to participate if we lose quorum. Um, it's a frustrating thing because you know, there are multiple hearings happening at the same time. And so council members absolutely need to be moving in and out and, and able to, to get to different hearings and do other things. And so I just want to highlight um, that, you know, this is a, a frustrating problem that these laws were ableist before the pandemic hit uh, and they obviously remain so. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can see some changes at the, the state level to uh, allow for participation and make sure that um, these things don't don't happen, but I appreciate y'all's patience. I'm very eager to to dive in and be able to participate on this hearing that we all have prepared very very hard for today. Uh, and with that, I'm going to give you my my opening statement. So again, thank you, Chair Hudson. Um, good morning, folks. My name is Tiffany Kavan. <laughs> Excuse me. My pronouns are she/her, and I am chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. And while it's well known that a historic percentage of New York's young people identify as LGBTQIA+, discussions of the over 100,000 LGBTQIA+, New Yorkers um, aged 65 or older are, are rare. And so the questions that we want to explore, right, are, are what challenges does this population face? Why, why there are disproportionately high rates of disability, physical, and mental distress? Um, why is there a lack of access to services? Uh, what is the cum cumulative effect of enduring discrimination, stigma, and discriminatory laws and policies decade after decade? What is life like for the generation who lost so many of their peers to the ravages of HIV, AIDS um, in the 1980s and 90s? And we know that compared with older adults in general, LGBTQIA plus older adults experience disparities in access to quality health care, uh, achieving economic stability and security, finding welcoming housing and inclusive long-term care facilities and maintaining strong and social and family support. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what are the causes of these disparities and how can we address them? This Pride Month, let us hear from our beloved older, our LGBTQIA plus neighbors, friends, and family, our elders. Um, what do they need to allow them to age with dignity? How culturally competent and equitable are the city's services? And how can the council help improve these outcomes? You know, I'm so glad to help chair today's hearing to probe into these and related questions and help make our city safer, healthier, more welcoming to all who live here. And especially proud to be doing this work as a, a queer Latina alongside another member of our queer family, Chair Hudson, um, and acknowledge the fact that I would not be here 
but for my queer elders. And so it is deeply personal to make sure that we are living up to the promises of our city and providing dignity and care for all the folks um, in our community. So thank y'all. There we go. Sorry about that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Chris Pepe. I'm Senior Legislative Counsel to the Committee on Aging. Uh, before we begin testimony, I want to note that hearing participants may submit written testimony for the record up to 72 hours after the hearing. Uh, now I will administer the oath um, to the commissioner uh, who will be uh, offering testimony. Please raise your right hand. I will read the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you, Commissioner. You may begin your testimony. Is this on? Um, okay, sorry, and we just want to take one, one second, Chair. I just wanted to also recognize Councilmember Mealy for the record. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. Great. Thank you all. Good morning and happy Pride, Chair Hudson, Chair Kabang, and the members of both the Aging and the Women and Gender Equity Committees. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss LGBTQIA+, older adults and their unique needs. In the middle of Pride Month, it is particularly poignant to highlight the, oh, no, I'm gonna take this off. I think it's easier for you and me, so I can breathe. Um, it is particularly poignant to highlight the older adult LGBTQ. IA plus population and how we can continue to strengthen our services for them. For the purposes of this hearing, I will use the terms LGBT and TGNC, although I understand the diversity of this community exceeds just these terms. Nationally, it is estimated that there are 2.7 million LGBT people that are age 50 and over, of which 1.1 million are 65 and older. Based on DIFTA's review of the research literature, we estimate that there are at least 100,000 older adults aged 60 and over who are LGBT. We think this is a conservative estimate uh, given the silent generation effect where some older New Yorkers are reluctant to share their self-identification information with others. It is expected that this population will grow somewhat between now and 2040. 2040, parallel with the overall expected growth in the older New York City population during this time. Roughly 1.6% of adults identify as transgender or non-binary within the LGBT older population. Approximately one in five are people of color, a proportion that is expected to double by 2050. Approximately one in three LGBT older adults lives at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Within the LGBT older adult population, there are a few subgenerations who have very different life experiences, especially as it re relates to the rights of the LGBT community. LGBT people born between 1920s and 19. 40s are in the invisible generation. They grew up during World War II and during a time in which LGBT individuals could be arrested for suspicion of being gay. It is followed by the silent generation born between the 50s and 60s. This generation was subject to McCarthyism, where people who were LGBT were categorized as a threat to national security and many were fired or denied employment based on this sexual orientation. Following the Stonewall, uh, the Stonewall riots, many achievements were achieved, advancements were achieved, including the passage of marriage equity and the 2015 Supreme Court decision upholding same-sex marriage equality. With these varied experiences also came a wide range of engagement with formal and informal systems of care and a history of engagement or the lack of engagement in formal or government services. These generational experiences within the LGBTQAI plus community parallel those that we see broadly within older adults and other services. While we made great strides towards equal equality, 
towards rights and protections for LGBT individuals in recent years have been particularly challenging, often resulting in a sense of reduced safety and less openness. The previous federal administration, for example, put policies in place that derailed years of progress and the path towards increased inclusion and protection. We also have seen an increase in hostile state and local laws that threaten the safety of the LGBT population. I think of Florida. This is compounded by a history of discrimination that leaves many LGBT older adults with general distrust of mainstream institutions that many heterosexuals and LGBT young people assume are in place to help them. Within the transgender, uh, gender non-binary and non-conforming TGNBNC population, challenges can be even higher. New York has been pro proactive in protections, including allowing Gender X on the IDNYC, a New York State driver's license or birth certificate, the legal right to use a bathroom of choice, and continued funding for GNBNC and LGBT services. I am thrilled that just last week, President Biden reinforced the need for increased support and protections for the LGBT individuals by issuing an executive order. In this executive order, the President specifically outlines the need to address discrimination, social isolation, and health disparities faced by older adults. I look forward to further implementing guidance from this order. In addition to the stereotypes and discrimination, LGBT individuals are also subject to the intersectional discrimination based on other identities, such as age, race, language, and gender. These overlapping identities add to the complexity of ensuring that programs and supports are best equipped to support the needs of this population. As such, one of the best ways to increase access to services is to build trust and credibility. Not only are DIFTA staff required to take mandatory training, we are continuing to work with DIFTA providers to ensure that cultural competencies are developed among staff and clients. We had provided such training pre in the pre-pandemic on uh, the Older Adult Awareness Day on May 16th at a SAGE event, I had a conversation with Lynn, uh, the uh, Deputy Director at SAGE, to talk about resuming these training programs. This includes creating safe spaces for people of all identities. While seemingly simple to many, using a, per a person's correct pronouns can have a positive impact on the experience of that individual. We know that COVID-19 was isolating for older adults. The impact of isolation can be higher in the LGBT community, as they are twice as likely to be single, four times more likely not to have children, and twice as likely to live alone than other heterosexual older adults. As a result, the care structure, the care structure that they rely on is often horizontal, peer-to-peer, -peer, supporting rather than a vertical one. Since the start of the pandemic, DIFTA and our providers have conducted over 9.2 million uh, wellness engagements with older adults, focusing on reducing isolation. Additionally, DIFTA continues to work with experts in the field to ensure that cultural competency extends to the LGBT population and the care they receive. As you know, all services offered through DIFTA and our network of providers are open to all older adults, 60 and older, regardless of any other factors such as race, language, gender, expression, income, or sexual orientation. That said, there are unique needs of subpopulations within the older adult community, and DIFTA and our providers continue to build culturally competent services to address these unique needs. Within our older adult center network, there is at least one center in each borough that specializes in LGBT older adult centers. These centers such as Sage, Queens Community House, the Pride Center, the Griot Circle, welcome all older adults. Historically, LGBT individuals 
have often felt safer traveling outside their immediate community to access services. As such, there is often an increased willingness to travel to specialized centers where safety and community could be found. Same can be found in communities of color um, and also communities with special language needs. This is similar to what we have seen in some ethnic and minor minority groups who prefer to travel to a specific center to be further entrenched in community. That said, building cultural competency and safe spaces for all adults across the network is imperative. As part of the newest RFP for OACs and NORCs, for which contracts started in December 2021, all centers are asked how they will increase LGBT competencies. We also will continue to work with providers and this progress will be evaluated in annual reviews. Often LGBT older adults worry about the care they receive, including finding home health aides that will not have personal bias in their provision of service and will be sensitive to their specific needs and circumstances. For those in need of caregiving services, the SAGE Caregiver Program serves LGBT informal caregivers throughout the five boroughs of New York. The program offers caregiver information and assistance about services available in their community. They also offer supports, training, supportive counseling, and respite care. The program offers a service named Respite Buddy, where they contact an LGBT older adult care receiver with an LGBT volunteer that can offer them companionship and socialization. I'm gonna ad lib here. I remember that being so vital during the height of, of, um, of, the, of the virus. Um, often this program, not the COVID virus, <laughs> the AIDS virus. Often this program assists both the caregiver and the care receiver, since often the care receiver might be an LGBT older adult with limited social supports, and they may identify a friend or neighbor as their caregiver who provides some assistance to help them remain in the community. The SAGE Caregiver Program provides a great deal of flexibility in order to insist these dyads by recognizing that many LGBT older adults have chosen family as part of their lives. For many people, <clears throat> including LGBT uh, individuals, home is a safe haven. For many, home is a place of refuge and comfort, free of judgment and discrimination. Unfortunately, it can also be very isolating, which can inadvertently impact one's mental health. To help combat social isolation among older adults who prefer to stay at home, we even, even as we continue to recover from this pandemic, if they're not providers have since March 2020 conducted, I said, 9.2 social engagements and wellness calls to older adults at their homes. Additionally, DIFTA has provided mental health aid training to older adults and staff through the SAGE GRIOT to help identify and triage mental health concerns. The entire gen uh, geriatric mental health network is trained health professionals who are multilingual, multicultural, and can work with the LGBT community. <clears throat> Outside of the geriatric mental health, we also have a mental health provider who specializes in services for LGBT older adults. DIFTA also continues to monitor and to respond to emerging needs. For example, in 2020, DIFTA partnered with SAGE Puerto Rico to run a PSA uh, campaign targeting Puerto Rican LGBT older adults living in Puerto Rico and in New York City where the increase of suicide um, suicide ideation was pandemic. This followed an increase in mental health concerns in response to the impact of COVID-19 and the natural disaster that had taken place on the island. The ad reinforced that they were not alone and there were resources available to make them feel valued. I know today's hearing is also for a pre-consideration intro to establish a commission for LGBT older adults within DIFTA. I support this bill and the intent of this bill and look forward to working with you on the specific. As you know, DIFTA currently has an older adult advisory council which makes recommendation to DIFTA. 
One of the, of the 31 members of the New York City Council has 10 recommended appointees, of which six are currently vacant, um, rep, uh, comprising two representatives per borough. Members must be representative of social service agencies, healthcare, businesses, legal services, and academic community and local neighborhoods. The Older Adult Advisory Council is tasked with, task with making recommendations to improve the lives of older adults, including recommendations to address workforce development, which is a process that we worked with the council recently, and to prevent age discrimination. SAGE has been represented on the Older Adult Council since 2007. LGBT older advocates have served as members as well. I welcome the opportunity to discuss ways to add additional parameters to this council by the city council. In conclusion, while we firmly believe our network does a lot for the LGBT community broadly, we are cognizant that the trans experience and the experience of TGNC folks may require more specific services. We will continue to engage our providers, advisors, and advocate community to identify specific ways that we can support the nuanced needs of trans older adults and other subsets within the LGBT community. It is imperative that LGBT older adults feel safe while having access to all DIFTA services and programs. This is best established over time and can be started through simple acts like ensuring that people are referred to by the preferred name and the correct pro pronouns, acknowledge and celebrating expanded definitions of family, using inclusive language and actively listening to a person's story without judgment. This requires continuing tra continuous training of DIFTA staff and providers. We appreciate the partnership that we have with, Kate, with SAGE over the years <clears throat> and look forward to continuing this information sharing and instituting the, the different levels of SAGE care in our training curriculum. While DIFTA and provider staff regularly participate, we are in conversations to provide additional competency, uh, competency training for all contracted providers. LGBT providers such as SAGE often work to identify and partner with organizations where they can train staff on how to be inclusive and understand the unique needs of LGBT older adults. But organizations, but other organizations must also seek out these trainings as well. Getting advisory input from LGBT organizations and advocates is imperative. DIFTA is proud to have LGBT organizations and, adv um, and advocates represented at our, on our Older Adult Council and our New York Age-Friendly Commission. Additionally, DIFTA's Grandparents Resource Center team attends required LGBT uh, compet uh, competencies training annually as well as access to other workshops, such as legal training uh, workshops focusing on LGBT youth and the justice system. We also continue to partner with sister agencies who provide other services and support the LGBT older community. We are proud to have such strong relationships with the LGBT community within our network and outside of our network. Through these partnerships, we continue to advocate the best services in need, uh, and all to serve the needs of the LGBT older adult who call New York City their home. As always, we are grateful to the chairs and the committee for your advocacy and continued support of all the New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I have a, a few questions. I'll start with some questions um, specific to your testimony, if that's okay. Um, so to start, you testify that there will not be personal bias in the delivery of services, but how specifically can you ensure this? I'm sorry, I could not hear you. Yes, and you testified that there will not be personal bias in the delivery of services, and I'm wondering specifically how can you ensure that? We can ensure that by enforcing it, by monitoring it, and by offering training. Um, I guess the, the question is more so by, because by enforcing it, you're in, 
like what is it specifically that you're enforcing? Like how do you know that bias isn't being included in the delivery of services? Like are you surveying people? Are you doing any type of outreach? No, we, as we do with all other services where bias could emerge, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's two avenues, right? There's two pathways. One is in a, in a complaint, all right? And then taking action against that complaint. Uh, another one is to prevent bias by providing training and information, right? And the other pathway is by our regular monitoring, all right? And to ask, what trainings have you attended? what is being done for the LGBT. It was part of the RFP for older adult clubs and for NORCs this year, so okay. that we have the avenue to ask the questions. Okay. Um, I just wanna, wanna note that this population doesn't always um, report, right? We know with hate crimes, for example, uh, hate crimes against the LGBTQIA plus community are not always reported, and in fact, they're underreported. Um, so just, you know, a, just a note for you to take into consideration. Um, yeah, I just, it's very similar in the overall older population. Right. One in, one in 24 cases are, are reported. Um, so it's something that we have to be vigilant about. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, so you, you just mentioned the RFPs. The, Centers asked how they'll increase competencies. Do you have any early feedback on increasing competencies at some of these older adult centers? No, not yet. Okay. We're just, what, <laughs> I, I, I had a conversation this morning which reminded us, we're just getting back to a sense of normalcy about following up for the last two years we've yeah. been in an emergency yep. survival mode uh, and making sure that people had the basics, food insecurity. So, now we're looking at all of those programmatic and doing a thorough programmatic review. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Okay, well, I'll get a little bit more into the, the NORC RFP in just a second, but I wanna sure. go to some of these um, broader questions. What does DIFTA consider to be the biggest challenges facing LGBTQIA plus older adults in New York City and why? I think one of the biggest challenges for any older adult in New York City is housing and the affordability. Um, I think uh, the second uh, issue is, is uh, safety, you know, for LGBT community, um, as it is for all older adults. And um, those are the basic you know, food insecurity, it's the issues that we work on all the time. You know, food insecurity, financial insecurity, and, and services that keep you in your home uh, with the level of support so that you can uh, avoid institutionalization. Thank you, and uh, I just wanna pause for a second and uh, acknowledge for the record, Council Member Kevin Riley. Um, more specifically, uh, what do you see some of the biggest challenges facing LGBTQIA plus older adults of color? Income security, <laughs> safety, housing, uh, food insecurity. Um, I would just say it's, if, if you take it, take it to an Uber level, you know, and if you, all of these intersectionalities just compound um, the issue and uh, it's something that as a woman of color, I'm pretty much aware of and very cognizant of women of color with language, with special language preferences. Um, it's something that I'm very much aware of. And I think that, um, you know, we're tackling these things every day in this city, every day that, and I have to say that astonishingly that we are still confronting those kind of issues in New York City. It's just indicative of the time. And I know you mentioned um, SAGE and Grio Circle in your, in your testimony, and I know those are both organizations doing great work across the city. Um, so I know they're included in this, but with whom does DIFTA partner to provide services and resources? We have also, in addition to SAGE and Griot, 
<coughs> excuse me, we have the Queens Community Center, which uh, provides services in Queens. We also um, work with, what? There's one more. I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, the Pride Center um, that we work with closely. But if you were to ask me training and most of the in-home supports, our, our strongest partner has been SAGE. Okay. And SAGE has um, centers throughout the boroughs too. Is there anyone on DIFSA staff solely dedicated to improving the agency's work within the LGBTQIA plus community or the HIV plus community? Uh, you're talking about one single person? Yeah. Uh, I mean, or met or more if you have more. Oh, we have, we have plenty of people on, okay. on staff okay. who this is a primary issue for them for a variety of reasons. Um, we, also, but we also have our DEO officer who is whose primary responsibility is this falls under this officer also. <clears throat> okay. That being said, I just want to go back to the intent of the bill, you know, and how we support that. Okay. Thank you. LGBTQIA plus aging advocates recommend creating a standing commission on LGBTQIA plus aging within DIFTA to identify challenges, share best practices, and develop expert recommendations on ways to improve the quality of life of older LGBTQIA plus New Yorkers. And is DIFTA open to such a commission? I'm open to the intent of it, and we would love to have discussions with you on the specifics. Um, and this goes back to a, a broader view that we have about age inclusion and, in, and being inclusive um, at the Department for the Aging because we're, older adults are so marginalized. So we would love to use this opportunity to have discussions with you about building that into the advisory council so that all of the issues can be addressed simultaneously. Um, and right now the council has five vacancies, and one soon to, uh, and other vacancies soon to uh, be created because the term has expired. So there's six vacancies, so we have a great opportunity to build in the infrastructure. Um, and then we will do comparable uh, in our age-friendly uh, commission, which already has a strong representation of LGBTQ older adults. Well, I know the borough delegations are working on those recommendations, so soon, Hopefully that. Yeah, that there are two in the there. Bronx. Well, there's one in the Bronx with a possible uh, second, two in Staten Island, two in Queens, one in Brooklyn. Yep. Okay. We're on it. Good. We need it. <laughs> Does DIFTA assist agencies in crafting more inclusive policies, practices, and written materials for older adults, including LGBTQIA plus older adults, for HIV plus older adults? It was part of the, the RFP this year um, and the NORCs, the Older Adult Club. So it'll be something that we'll be reviewing with them regularly. And again, it's going to be part of the training that we will be rolling out soon. But do but you I help think, other agencies? I beg your pardon? Do you help other agencies, though, in, in terms of providing some of that information to other agencies, other city agencies? We're always providing aging information, and this is part of it to other city agencies. You know, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's in isolation, but it, it's all inclusive, as we do with language rights, as we do with uh, other biases. <clears throat> okay. Um. Sorry, I'm just pulling questions from a lot of different places here. Um, going back to some of the the calls that you mentioned in your in your testimony, um, the, the wellness social, calls, social engagement, yes, <coughs> wellness calls. When you conduct those calls, do you always do you always do more than one call, or how do you identify who to reach out to? And is there an outreach program, or do people learn about, or how do people learn about the resource? Well. 
there's two ways, there's two avenues. There were avenues where people identify that they wanted a call, there were, and then there's the service providers. It could be the older adult club, it could have been the geriatric mental health provider, it could have been the case management agencies. And that's how we did multiple calls. Um, not to be flip or glib here, but there were times when we made so many calls that someone would say, I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> you don't need to call me again. But um, it was just a constant check-in. We were in a, in a state that we had no idea how people were doing and we needed to make sure. If you weren't getting a food, a meal delivered to your home, that, you know, usually you came to the center and that was our point of contact. But now everything was being done to your home and so we needed to make sure that there were still points of contact. Thank you. And then just getting into uh, demographics a bit, can you describe the kind of demographic information DIFTA collects from older New Yorkers that access DIFTA programs and, re and services? And when and how is such data collected and for what purposes? So, you know, including the, the wellness calls or beyond those? So, I'm going to go back to some basics. The, the demographic information is self identified. Right, and the provider does that through our, uh, through our client data system. And that's on a regular basis, all right? They provide that on a regular basis. Um, the other data we collect is from census data or other research that we do to collect data on the various intersectionalities of older adults. Was that the question? Yes, and then my, I mean, my next question was going to be, can you disaggregate the race and ethnicity of New Yorkers that access DIFTA programming and services? So you just, you know, talked about various populations. Right, it's, it's self-identified, um, so we do it to the best of the, to, to the best of the ability that we have. <clears throat> okay. And, then, so and no. then we extrapolate sometimes based on census. Okay. Um, do you ever collect data related to an individual sexual orientation or gender identity or HIV status? No, we do not collect it. We just gather it from self-identified. Okay, is there a specific reason why you don't collect that information or why you haven't? And might you consider doing that in the future? It would be something we would look at on all data, so I'll get back to you on that. I'm not. Okay. Michael? Yeah. All right. Can, so, sure. Um, what, Mike, what I've just been informed is that we do collect data, but obviously people refuse to answer some of, of the questions, and so that's right. We're limited by people's responses. Okay, understood. Um, can you estimate the number of queer older adults that access DIFTA programming and services on either a monthly or annual basis? We'll get back to you on that. Okay. We, we're estimating that there are 100,000 older adults uh, in New York City, and if you think that, if you extrapolate that we serve about 50,000 of the 1.6 million, we can. I think that, just to correct it for the record, I think the number is over 200,000 that we've 200,000 for 50 and over. We and you're saying 100,000 for? 60. I see, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna toss it over to Chair Tiffany Caban to ask some questions and then we'll come back to my other colleagues who are in the room. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, so I, I'd like to start by moving into talking a little bit about social isolation. Commissioner, I know that you touched on this in your, in your testimony and I'd love to dig into that in, in a, a, a bit greater detail. Um, so we know that a, a third of LGBTQIA plus adults report feeling socially isolated. There are similar rates among individuals age 50 plus living with HIV and these feelings were obviously only exacerbated by pandemic and other thing that, that you obviously acknowledged in, in your testimony 
in uh, FY21, the City Council's priorities outlined in Schedule C um, included prioritizing services for socially isolated older adults. Um, and so a, a couple questions related to that. Uh, you touched on it a little bit, but specifically in more detail, could you talk about the steps, uh, what steps was DIPTA able to take to ensure dedicated outreach to older adults um, who are categorized as, as having little to no support structures um, that were supported under DIPTA contracts funded by discretionary, council discretionary dollars? So the process uh, was the same. There would be uh, wellness calls. We did virtual programming, right? And we, and individuals were identified either by the Home Delivered Meals Program, the Case Management Agency, the uh, older adult clubs made the calls to their individuals, to their, to their members, and as well as the mental health service providers. So all of those uh, service providers were reaching out to their constituents as well as other constituents. We also were able to identify uh, individuals who were getting get food, and some of those individuals also got called. People who were unknown to DIFTA's network in the past. And what, uh, what, what do those outreach efforts look like? I mean, you've, you've named the, the categories um, and the services that were provided, but like, how are targeted populations identified and reached, and, and what metrics are used to determine the efficacy of uh, that outreach? So uh, the primary point of contact was a call, right? And um, the other was a, uh, emails at times were sent, but the primary point of contact was a call, and it was a wellness check. It was to ensure that that person was either receiving services and also just to break the isolation that so many of us felt. And we collected, we collected data on not only the number of calls made, but where the calls were made also. Um, and in addition to, to calls and emails, are there any other mediums that y'all use for, for outreach? Um, do you do any door to door or um, any other forms? We rely on our, our local partners. You know, it's, it's the older adult club. It's the, those are the partners that we re rely on. Those are our trusted partners. And in addition, those trusted partners have other trusted partners in the community um, that were also providing fluid information as to what was some of the needs needed at that time. Um, those are the main forms of communication. Oh, and there was also virtual programming, which was another way to get people engaged and continue to be engaged as they were isolated and could not go to their congregate sites. Thank you. Um, and you talked about the, obviously you touched on, on the clubs um, and, and there are many queer older adults who wanna have community spaces where they can socialize without receiving services and, and many of those folks are under the age of 62 and I know SAGE provides programming to, to people 50 plus living with HIV, with HIV. And so my question is, can more OACs be opened up to this population, whether it's by braiding in funding or, or otherwise? As I testified, all older adult clubs uh, are eligible for all older adults. They cannot, whether it's race, gender, sexual orientation, they cannot be prohibited from receiving those services. What we've done for this round of RFPs, excuse me, um, which we had not done before, was that we will now be collecting data as to what kind of outreach um, and services are being provided to the LGBT community it was something that was not done in the past. Yeah, and, and again, just to, to follow up or double down on the question is more specifically, you know, can, 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 more, um, can more of these clubs be, do you think it's possible for more of these clubs to be opened up? And also, you know, what kinds of, how can we at the council support that work? Yeah, so that, that's a yes, yes, right? Yes, we should have more clubs that are specialized 
uh, where people can have the safety and the comfort of being around individuals that are similar to them, whether that is an AAPI, whether that's an LGBTQ, um, whether that is a, a Latino club. So there, we are encouraging that. But what I'm also encouraging is the ensuring that the staff have the training to make sure that we eliminate any biases so that people of any kind can be comfortable in those settings also. So it's cultural yeah, I, competency. I, you know, I think, I think, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the point is taken. I guess, I guess one thing that I would like to offer um, is, you know, and, and this is just like personally speaking from uh, my experiences as a, as a, um, as a queer person, not, not an elder just yet, but I hope to live long enough to be one. Um, but, you know, I, I think, yes, it is one thing to create spaces that are incredibly, you know, inclusive um, so that all types of folks can congregate and be Absolutely. in community with one another. But there, you know, also really is no substitute for like those specialized spaces that create the opportunity for you know, just queer folks um, to get together and, you know, I think I could probably take a lot longer to articulate it, but I won't. No, that's, you I'm said it perfectly. Of, breath, but, um, but, you know, it is, I think that even as a, a young person, I can only really imagine as an older adult, how, um, how, how much that is additive to mental, emotional, and physical health. And I'd go even as far as saying it's life-saving in a lot of ways. So I, I do, you know, it's something that I strongly, you know, support and, and encourage. For sure, um, but you brought up the, the the biases point, so I actually wanted to roll back for uh, a second. I know my my colleague Chair Hudson touched on this a little bit, uh, asking follow ups around uh, how biases get rooted out or identified. And I know that you mentioned training uh, that you uh, address them as complaints come in, that you do some regular uh, monitoring. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, you said that there wasn't proactive surveying, and then and then my follow-up question to that is, um, do you have, again, because there are all kinds of reasons why folks don't, um, don't report, and they can differ based on, you know, intersection of identities, um, differ based on the, the types of trauma histories folks have, and so is there a network of, of like, you know, peer navigators or, or peer supports that are also able to do some of this like proactive reaching out to, to folks who might not be inclined to on their own um, issue a complaint when, you know, the training doesn't end up being enough or, you know, when we're not seeing it as, as high of a reporting rate as we would like. No, we don't, but that's an excellent idea. We're gonna look into that. I mean, seriously, there is, um, I just thought, as you, you just prompted the thought of working with SAGE so that we can have Angriot and the Queens Community Center and the Pride Center to work with them to develop this core of peer navigators that can help us in the 308 older adult clubs. Um, so that is, that is an idea that I would love to, um, to ponder and, and really figure out how we can do this. Um, and I yes, we always welcome your support. Though. I was going to say that, yes. <laughs> but the other, I want to go back to your earlier question, which is about being in creating spaces um, where can, people can fully self-actualize, uh, self whatever that is, um, and whatever, whatever, regardless of your, of your, orientation, language, or race. In particular for LGBTQ, is it sufficient that we have one per borough? Absolutely not. Should we be working towards that expansion? Absolutely, and that is something that we will continue working with you on and also will be reviewing. Um, in, the, in, in, in the interim, what we can do is make sure that we create as many of those spaces that we do have to make sure that we create safety within those. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. And and my next question, forgive my ignorance, because I imagine maybe this has been explored in, in earlier um, hearings, but with the clubs, what requirements are they? Do they have to be, do folks have to be residents? Could they, you know, what about if you're a documented, um, you know, like residents of, of, of New York City or New York State, or could they, you know, what if they're from New Jersey, whatever it might be? You cannot be from New Jersey. So I'm glad you stopped yourself. <laughs> uh, but if you are a resident of New York, you can go to any older adult club. I can choose to go to Betances in the Bronx, even though I may live in East Harlem. I may choose to go to the Pride Center, even though I don't live in that borough or in that neighborhood. You can choose to go to any older adult club that, of your choice, all right? And, and in terms of documentation status, there's no... Um, mm, we're, New York is a safe haven state. And New York City is a state, safe haven city. We absolutely, we, we are so, we don't, the question is never asked. And do you have to, um, do you have to show an, an ID to, to be able to access the space? No, nope, not at all. Regardless of income, um, and any other identification. As long as, the only requirement is that you're 60 plus and that you live in the city of New York. Got it, okay. thank you. Um, so I'm gonna shift a little bit. I wanna move over into um, food insecurity. Um, you know, again, many aging service providers who work with communities facing high poverty rates, including where older adults report that the grab and go uh, meal program has been instrumental in their communities and are worried about the impact of, of that program shutting down. And so has, has DIFTA considered, um, you know, maintaining that program at older adult centers in perpetuity, despite it originally being an, an emergency COVID program? Are you talking about recovery meals? I don't, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. The, um, the, the grab and go meal program. Oh, grab and go. Thank you. That's a yeah. good question. So grab and go was an emergency provision um, that was allowed during the pandemic. As a matter of fact, it was allowed because New York City started it. Um, and it was, uh, it has been suspended by the State Office on Aging. We are looking at phasing out um, this suspension of it because we know that it's a, a tool. Uh, but what we've allowed is um, before we start implementing the SOFA new requirement is that um, a program could continue to provide a grab and go as long as they're also providing congregate meals. The issue is that we would not want grab and go to become a substitute for congregate sites. We've invested in this whole notion called older adult clubs. We want people to start coming back. It was something that the council has, you know, wanted people to start coming back fully. And that grab and go is also, a, almost becomes a barrier for people to come back. Or not a barrier, barrier might be a too strong a word, I don't know, whatever the artful word is of, you know, being in, in a default pl a program rather than people coming back to the older adult club. And we want to really encourage more and more people. We know this pandemic, you're a perfect example, it's not over, um, but we have guidance and we have provisions and we really want older adults to start coming back to the centers as much as possible. Well, and I, and I guess I wanna, I wanna push on that a, a little bit because I'm glad you said it, right? The pandemic is not over and I, I understand the inclination of wanting to get people in for programming, but to your point, and I'm a, a perfect um, example as somebody who consistently masked, right? Especially indoors, um, you know, I still, where I can avoid gathering in certain places and things. And so, you know, I just, I, like, how, how do you, how does DIFTA reconcile um, you know, giving older adults, for example, the, the freedom and autonomy to, to take the calculated risks that they feel comfortable with and not having it be at the expense of being able to participate in what is clearly, um, you know, a, a really, a, a really important program, right? Providing, um, providing meals. And so, you know, would, would y'all consider pursuing 
keeping this program in perpetuity so that people have the option to do grab and go who for really valid reasons still don't want to be gathering in congregate settings which is which is going to be the case for the foreseeable future right like this you know, the pandemic is not gone i don't see it being gone uh, anytime remotely yeah. soon and people still need to eat so we would we would we would uh, keep advocating to SOFR that in New York it may be required to go on longer than they have anticipated. That goes without saying. You know we have to base it on what we started grab and go, and we will know to advocate with SOFR if it needs to be continued as an option. All right. In perpetuity, I think that's a little too far fetched. Um, so we agree in concept that this has to be a a service available should it be continued as a service model forever. Um, I don't know that I agree with that, but I do agree that until we get to a comfortable level, we meaning older adults and the city of New York, we need to keep having some emergency provisions in place. But I'm just going to ask one more follow-up, and then I want to pass it to one of my my colleagues. So um, I feel like what, there is what we call uh, uh, your your disagreement is duly noted. So I feel like we do sit in what we call a zone of agreement, where there is at, at least some period of time yes. um, where we agree this should continue. And so what is what does that look like right right now? So it, as we sit right now, for how long? Would y'all continue to, to push and advocate for these these grab and go um, meals to continue, so that folks can have that option and and um, and absorb the risk that they feel comfortable taking? Well, it was it, the goal was to suspend grab and go in the new fiscal year, July. Given where we are and given the participation levels at older adult clubs, it is something that we have to uh, revisit, and we have to revisit that with SOFA, well, with SOFA meaning the State Office on Aging, who, who's, who suspended you know, the, uh, the emergency procedure provision. And can dip to follow up with council on, on how, the, uh, how those conversations are, are going? Sure, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. And then I'll pass it over to uh, Council Member Stevens, so I know some questions. Go, um, good morning. Thank you for being here with us. I, I just have one question because the bulk of my questions were already asked by Tiffany because so, she did such a great job. Between her and Chair um, Hudson, they've been doing a great job asking the question. So I just wanted to know, um, you might not have them today, but is it possible for you to provide a breakdown of the LGBTQI seniors by borough? Yeah, it'll probably be uh, an estimate, you know, uh, based on the data that we have. But yes, we could do. Is that. it not up to date? I beg your pardon. Because you said it's an estimate. Is it not up to date? Is this? Is this no, no, no. It's an module? estimate because it's all self-identified data. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then, what we usually do if it's self-identified, then we extrapolate. They're much smarter than I am. So they look at the data and then they compare it to total populations and they can come and give an estimate of what that number is. All right? Yeah, we'll provide that. Okay. Right. We'll, we could do that for give you something currently and then we could report it back to you in the future, you know, as, as time goes on so that we could. All right. Great. Thank you. We're now going to move to uh, Council Member Richardson Jordan. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the testimony. I, um, I, I wanted to ask about kindred networks that are run by peers, and actually Chair Caban uh, touched on it. And I, I like where that conversation went in terms of the peer navigators. Uh, but specifically in my district, we have a, a population of older African American women um, who are lesbian community and you know we we of course have a rich lgbtq community in general but um in terms of the district and the demographics we have we have older black women 
And so I wanted to ask specifically about funding and resources and community-based um, orgs that deal with uh, African-American lesbians. Um, is there funding available and programming available for that specific group? And is that something being tracked? Um, there is no funding specific to that. We would engage, love to engage with you in a conversation about that. Um, as you always, as I always say, the, the needs are greater than the resources. So, um, am I it's, So we, when we talk about the breakdown of LGBTQIA, do we, uh, do we not then really have a breakdown of, you know, the L specifically or the, you know, do we, do we have it actually broken down at you know, that we kind don't. Of level we, for we, we know that 66% of our population are females. So, okay. um, and then we know the African American population. And so, that what we would have to do is, you know, look at the data and come up and with, like you know, figure out what, what that number is. Um, but there are no. So funny because I was looking at a lunch yesterday, a uh, special that they had on TV. There is no program specific for African American uh, uh, gay women. And um, one of the things that we would have to look at is, you know, who, who is that, where is it, and how would we fund that? And that would be a conversation that we will continue with you. Okay, I definitely, I definitely look forward to the conversation. And um, I just want to say that when I was reading this bill, one of this is the type of work that I thought would be great um, coming from a commission. If there were were folks who were able to laser focus and drill down on on intersections and and things like that, um, I did also want to ask because you brought it up in your testimony, and I was curious about the annual reviews for all centers, and you were saying that. Um, uh, there's a look at LGBTQIA competencies. Uh, could you just expand on that? Like what exactly is measured or, or looked at in that space, in, in the review, in the annual so, review? So as, as I said earlier in my testimony also, for the last two years, we've been focused on pandemic and food insecurity and isolation, right? We've, Beginning in May, we had a little bit of a breather and we could put our heads up and start looking at program issues. But we had the foresight uh, when we did the RFP to include the LGBT language in there, all right? And so that will give us the opportunity to, um, that'll give us the opportunity during our, our regular monitoring. It also gives us the opportunity to work with programs around outreach, work with programs around training. But I wanna also say that the network of providers also have the responsibility to reach out and do that. It should not always be top down. It, it should be peer to peer. Um, there are resources that they could reach out to also. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to move up to Council Member Shulman. Thank you very much. I want to thank. Can I want? I just wanted to. I'm sorry. Go back to the. And I was just told by staff, reminded that last week the mayor announced 6.7 million dollars for LGBT services, including Harlem Pride. So it is one of those areas that we should have a conversation around older adults and any any specific uh, groups in that intersectionality that we would like to focus on. So that's an opportunity. Thanks. I, I wanna thank um, Chairs Hudson and Caban for today's important hearing. I wanna thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony and your openness uh, to what we're talking about. I am sitting here as an older adult lesbian, so. <laughs> I'm the person that you would be trying to recruit uh, for the, your senior centers. Uh, so here's my question. How do, you, how do people that live in a neighborhood or community find out about their local senior center? Like, what kind of recruitment materials or outreach do you do? 
There's a variety of ways that people can find out about their local um, older adult club. The way they do that is one, the older adult club reaches out to all of the trusted partners, churches, community centers, and other trusted partners in the community, and vice versa. Those trusted uh, partners also reach out to the older adult club. In addition to that, um, we encourage and have provided funding so that older adult clubs can do outreach. Um, in DIFTA's website, there is a listing of all of our older adult clubs. And in our Aging Connect uh, in, uh, Center, our, our major information and referral uh, uh, program, there is also information that they will give you beyond um, where your local center is, where your local home delivered meals is, where, you know, what the, what the gamut of services are that the department offers. So for the LGBTQIA plus community, some of those trusted partners are not places where we would necessarily have relationships. So something maybe to do is to talk to the LGBTQ political clubs, to the LGBTQ bars, or no DOHMH goes into the bars and when they have information about various programs and services that they want to connect folks with. I mean, there's a variety of places that would ne not necessarily, because the trusted partners would not necessarily reach to me. Um, so I, you know, that's one. And the other is that, um, you know, to collaborate, and there are, there are a number of them, and we can, we can certainly work with you on that. Um, and the other is, do you have marketing materials that say, so if I go up on a website and I see all of these older center, older sen older centers for older adults, sorry, um, I don't know which ones are LGBTQ friendly or not. I understand overall that everyone's supposed to be accepting, but some may, you know, I. Like, so I want to go someplace where I know that I'm going to be, you know, welcomed and it's going to be um, something that's easy for me to enter into. And, you know, so that's what I'm asking you. So, yeah, uh, we have in each borough, um, there is a center um, that will be that will be identified so that you would know exactly okay. where you can choose to go. But in the ideal world. In my ideal yes. world, we would have the sense of sensitivity. No, I, I, I get that. You know, I mean, one day I will be happy when all of the intersectionalities can feel Do you have, like, so embraced. for example, do you partner with AARP and send out to folks uh, brochures or something else saying, hi, you've reached X age, um, maybe there's a way to do a mailing to folks and say, um, you know, we have these, you've you know, we have these centers in your community. We welcome you to come visit them. Maybe you have something where you have uh, some of these centers maybe can do welcoming days um, for folks and, you know, people can see what they're like. So, you know, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm talking from personal experience, so that's why I'm asking these questions. Thank you yeah. for that question, Lynn. I mean, Councilwoman. <laughs> there right. is, um, there's a variety of approaches that the local, um, yeah clubs use, the local older adult clubs use, including welcome centers um, and welcome days. Um, and I never thought of, frankly, that the department would do a massive outreach on that. I'm just trying to educate the community to be less ageist than what it is. Right. So if I'm going to put my money, that's where I put my money in combating ageism. But it'll be interesting to see if we can get a partner to help us with a PSA to that effect. No, I think... But, I, my, but our biggest issue here is ageism that we have to combat. As, no, I, as no understood. And um, so... I know you do demographics on age, um, not necessarily LGBTQIA+, unless, uh, uh, let me just finish this question, unless somebody is self-reflecting um, of that. Um, do you have data of the age, the ages of the people that use the older adult centers in each district? Because some districts are older than others, 
And so somebody like me that's in my, you know, I'm 64, but I'm not 74. And so is there a way to get that data so that we can make an assessment too of, you know, who's using these centers? And maybe we there's have, some outreach that can be done around that. The one data that we have definitively is age data. Okay. And that we could do. And we can, okay. dis we thank can disaggregate my, that. My time is up, so thank you. Uh, I'm going to move to Councilmember Riley. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Absolutely. How you doing, Commissioner? It's a pleasure Those to meet you. Right, uh, I'm just going to piggyback off of Councilmember Shulman because she asked a question that I was going to ask. Um, how can it become... Uh, how can a organization become a trusted partner to an older adult center or club? Oh, easily. You know, uh, they welcome partnerships. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we encourage certain partnerships uh, with the older adult clubs, for example, health providers, uh, local banks, uh, faith based organizations. You know, we encourage those because we know that those are all places that older adults go to. Um, and so we want that, you know, exchange. Because I, I know in my district, I represent the Northeast Bronx. So I have Rain, I have Jasa, all my uh, seniors. You have me? I have you. <laughs> all my seniors, uh, that's what we call them in my district. Uh, they usually go to these centers, but I just want to make sure that we're uh, partnering them with the older adult uh, clubs within the Bronx. And for the record, and from to educate me, can you just name the older adult club that's in the Bronx uh, so I can know for my knowledge? Well, uh, Rain has seven of them. Okay. All right. So they're Rain Park Chester, Rain Bailey, Rain Boston Road. Um, there is also Bronx House has uh, several. They are, um, let me see who else is in the Bronx. There's Parkchester, um, there's Neighborhood Shop, there's Betances, there is East Side House, um, they're about. Okay. There's a whole host of programs in the Bronx. Thank in the you. Northeast yes. Bronx in particular, it would be uh, rain is the predominant. I think one. it's rain, and, and we have some JASA programs over there as well. Um, I did come in, you were talking about financial insecurities. Uh, could you just elaborate on how uh, DIFTA assists older adults with fi financial insecurities that they're going through? Uh, for instance, I do have a lot of homeowners in my district who are in cognizant of a lot of programs, grants that are out there that can help them with a lot of bills. Uh, that they're uh, seeing now, especially during the pandemic. Could you just elaborate more on how the DIFTA assists older adults with those uh, issues? There's a variety of ways that we assist older adults around the issue of financial insecurity. One is op information. The other one is workforce opportunities. Um, we have a senior employment program for low income. Right now, we are in conversations with AmeriCorps to expand that for the non-income eligible. And then we have uh, Silver Stars, uh, which that would be called Silver Core. And then we have Silver Stars, which in New York City, older adult retirees can return back to, to an agency for um, up to $38,000 to continue because you no longer can afford to retire. People are working longer because of uh, the income insecurity. And the Silver Star program, I was in the center last week. Uh, does DIFTA go out and help seniors uh, sign up for these programs? Because I did have a senior uh, who didn't know how to sign up for the program. Um, so do, do you guys actually go out and help them at these centers? We work with the agencies okay. and we, have, we were very, very uh, fortunate that we sent a letter signed by Dawn Pintock at uh, DCAS, myself, and Jacques at OMB, Jacques Jahad at, uh, at OMB, three of us co-signed the letter um, to make sure that every agency, city agency knows that this is an opportunity for their retirees. Thank you. And my last question, uh, social isolation uh, is something that we spoke about and Chair Gabon went into that. Um, something I see that works in my neighborhood, uh, there's a lot of youth uh, that go, uh, grew up on certain blocks that go in and check on a lot of the seniors. Um, they even may help mow their lawn, uh, shovel their snow. Is there any way that DIFTA could work with DYCD to see if we could create like a program uh, that younger uh, 
youth on certain areas could actually check up on um, the seniors because I do feel like phone calls are, are, are cool, they're nice, but I do feel like you know physical and social engagement is important. So uh, it's just an idea, something we could kind of you know think about and go into details moving further. But I do think it would be a good idea if we could kind of involve our youth with uh, checking in on our seniors. As right well. now, we're in conversations with DYCD about an intergenerational program. It is not about friendly visiting. Um, that there's a whole host of issues. Well, not friendly, maybe like a buddy system that they yeah. could have. So we're looking at um, just having them engage with older adults and having older adults engage in some of the youth programs. So that's a conversation that we're currently having. Um, to go back to another question you had asked, the other way that we help uh, people around uh, financial insecurities is that we have a bill pay a program and it sounds almost, you know, it's, it's intuitive, right? It helps you pay bills. But it also uh, provides training programs that we have conversations like Meet the Expert to help people around some of their financial questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hudson. Thank you, Chair Cabal. Thank you. So, yeah, so we will turn it back to Chair Hudson now for more questions. Thank you, and thanks to all of my colleagues for um, asking such great and thoughtful questions. I would like to um, just go back a little bit to inclusivity um, and ask what work is DIFTA doing to ensure that all older adult centers are welcoming and affirming to LGBTQIA plus elders? And you mentioned in your testimony um, the training that uh, folks take on. So if you can just describe that training in a bit more detail, who's required to take it and how often, and um, does the training include how to handle issues such as harassment or discrimination related to a client's gender identity, HIV AIDS status, or sexual harassment, for example, among clients? Um, so, it DIFTA staff is required to take the training every year, right? Uh, for providers, we are reinstituting that uh, training. We're working with SAGE to look at the, SAGE has, SAGE Care has about five levels, maybe four, gold, platinum, bronze, whatever, maybe about four stages. And we're looking at offering the basic introductory uh, program, um, and then gradually coming up with a plan so that we can offer all of those services to the providers. Thank you. And uh, what queer-focused programming does DIFTA sponsor? Is there any consistent queer-focused programming across, across older adult programs in the DIFTA network, such as Pride celebrations? Yeah, that's done throughout you know, um, individual centers do it. And that has been something that has been encouraged as we do definitely at DIFTA, um, but also across our network. So all, all older adult centers provide no, some sort of- that's not what I said. You're saying that it's select ones based on their own. So are you saying that it's just the five that are identified as- No, eligible? I'm saying throughout the network, you'll see a variety of programs offering all kind of, of, of celebrations, including pride celebrations, and not just the five programs. But um, nothing that's specifically sponsored by DIFTA. Like it's not, it's not like a standard. Like for example, probably most if not all centers celebrate something like Black History Month, right. um, Women's right. History Month, something like that. So not as many celebrate pride or anything Absolutely. else that's specific to the LGBTQIA plus community. Is, yes. that, is that a correct statement? That is a correct statement. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say not as many because I don't know the number, but I do know that it is celebrated across the city at different centers um, as black history, you know, Latino history, Puerto Rican pride month, which is November. Um, and any of those uh, kind of um, celebrations, identification celebrations. Um, are any of them DIFTA sponsored? Uh, no. 
Uh, we don't sponsor those activities. What we do is support and encourage them to be done at the local level. So you are supporting and encouraging yes. centers to do right. pride celebrations? Yeah. Okay. And I no to that. We have not done that yet. What we did do was introduce the notion that LGBTQ uh, had to be included as part of the, as part of the center now. And it's something that we'll be looking at. And of course, it's something that we'll always encourage. I have conversations monthly with the providers, and this is the stuff that we will be rolling out all the time. Okay. Um, you know, we know uh, that we exist, right? That older LGBTQIA plus folks exist. So I think any opportunity to affirm the existence of older LGBTQIA plus folks Absolutely. Um, and make sure that all centers have the tools and resources they might need and they may not even know they need in order to support those individuals would probably go a long way. Um, totally agree with you. Thank you. Uh, one third of uh, LGB older adults and one half of transgender older adults live at or below 200% of the federal poverty line compared to a quarter of all older people. Higher poverty rates disproportionately impact LGBTQIA plus older adults of color. What is DIFTA's strategy to identify and conduct outreach to economically insecure LGBTQIA plus older adults and connect them to services? We don't have a strategy specific for LGBTQ. Uh, that's not to say that it's not something that is part of a broader program that we would not uh, encourage. I think, um, and forgive me, I just have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> Go ahead, that's all right. <laughs> but, you know, we know obviously that the older adult population is increasing and with that will be the older LGBTQIA plus population as well. And, you know, something that I say all the time and I know that, you know, people know is that we've come a very long way in terms of, you know, LGBTQ rights, um, but we still have a lot further to go. And so I think whatever, and, and this population, I think Chair Caban touched on this in her opening statement, but you know, we stand on the shoulders of the people who are still here with us and, and walking around. And so we wanna make sure that they have everything they need to, to thrive and survive and live with dignity and to live safely. And so I think we can't really stop at, you know, the pride parades and marches and rallies that we as a society have that really, I would venture to say perhaps tends to exclude older adults. I mean, even thinking about the capacity one might have to actually march a mile or two miles or three miles in these parades is not necessarily the most accessible way for older LGBTQIA New Yorkers to celebrate um, you know, our history. And so creating you know, explicit and very intentional opportunities in older adult centers where people have the space to be, you know, who they are and to celebrate themselves and, and the lives and the work that they've done, um, I think is something that we have to be proactive about and we can't really wait for, um, you know, we, I, I feel like, in, and we've had this conversation before with regards to all older adults, right? It's like too late once you're already the older adult to start advocating for or older money adults. and jobs. Right, exactly. <laughs> so I just want to say for the record that I think as much as we can do um, to support this community in particular, you know, the better. Yeah, um, I, I, you know what, I'm not going to let that go without a response. Sure. <laughs> so as much as we can do, we will do. All right. And I think the Department for the Aging had clearly an, an intent when we put it into the RFP explicitly. Um, so that being said, we know, I know, the importance of not being marginalized and being able to self-actualize my whole being, wherever I am, and to have safe places for that. And that is no different 
for the older LGBT population. It's no different for the African American woman, for the Latina. It is, and that is what we strive for, is to create havens where they can totally self-actualize. Thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, and for your commitment as well. Um, I wanna get a bit into health and, and mental health. And if you can describe the mental health programming that's available to older adults, and I'm wondering if providers are culturally, co culturally competent to take on LGBTQIA plus clients specifically. Um, so let me describe the program for you first, all right? Um, let me get to my right page. The, what, we, what we now have is, f we started out with 25, um, I can't read my own handwriting. Um, we started out with 25 um, mental health, geriatric mental health programs, hi. And we had them since 2007, way before the pandemic. And one of the things, and then um, fortunately, we were able to grow to 40. Um, thank you. We were able to grow to 40, and now, uh, with the with the influx of some additional funds, of which we always are going to thank you, and the City Council for your partnership, we now will be we now will have 88 programs. The way to expand our capacity, and then I also before I get to that, and the and one of the things that is very much on my mind, and it's it's been imprinted was a conversation that we had with Councilwoman Linda Lee several months ago, um, where she was real clear, can we start looking at opportunities to make sure that the geriatric mental health services can be done in communities of color and communities with special language needs? And it's something that we've been looking at um, for the last uh, few months since then. Um, so we have 88 uh, programs. And what our model is, it's a hub and spoke model. Geriatric mental health uh, are health services provided by a licensed cl uh, clinician through older adult uh, centers um, in, to individuals or groups. Uh, the programs now, because of the pandemic, are provided by, via telephone and, of course, will resume uh, in person. Group therapy includes happy days, coping with everyday life, brain health, men, uh, mindfulness, decluttering, and the group is currently on hold, of course, because of the pandemic, but we're all also hoping to go back. One of the f basic uh, services that we provide is a desensitization around mental health, um, trying to eliminate the stigma. Um, for the primary uh, mental health provision uh, provider, their specific physical space needs. Um, so as, as such, old, many older adult sites cannot serve as a direct site for a geriatric mental health program. Our model is a hub and spoke that, um, which allows a direct access to the program. In this model, clinicians provide engagement assessment uh, treatment at the hub site, the primary site, and then which spokes over to uh, engagement and assessment uh, and brings back the, uh, the individual to the hub site for treatment. These services, obviously, for now, are being done virtually. Um, we will be able to do these, hopefully, soon in person. And we do have a, a center that is uh, trained and targeted to help with the LGBT community. Thank you. Um, I know uh, Council Member uh, Richardson Jordan also asked questions about intersectionality, um, so I won't get into that. But I did wanna just um, touch on the HIV positive population. Three out of every five people living with HIV in New York City are now over the age of 50, and these older New Yorkers have pronounced physical and mental health needs that have been greatly exacerbated by the pandemic. What is DIFTA's role in promoting greater collaboration between HIV providers 
and aging providers to best support this growing population? I believe that the programs that we have targeted um, that specifically serve the LGBTQI community, A plus community um, have those kind of relationships. As we evolve and train more programs um, in this particular area, those relationships will continue and expand. And New York has God's Love We Deliver, which handles uh, the food insecurity for many of the HIV positive older adults who have medical needs. Um, okay, that kind of gets into this next question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway for the record. New Yorkers age 50 plus living with HIV are experiencing unmanaged rates of behavioral health issues. These needs must be met in order to adequately end the AIDS epidemic. How is the city addressing this population's unique mental health needs? Through our regular mental health programs and uh, obviously we're gonna to have to do more through partnerships. We already have one geriatric mental health program that is specific to LGBTQ populations. Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna turn it over to some other council members for a second round of questions. Yes, so uh, first we're going to move back to council member Shulman. Thank you, I actually just had one other question. Um, when we talked about trusted partners and we also talked about making sure that the older centers um, make people, make LGBTQIA members of the community feel welcome and all of that stuff. What do we do with faith-based centers? Because sometimes there are concerns there or concerns in the community that they're not as welcoming as others. Um, when we hear that any center mm -hmm. is discriminating or excluding uh, something that we look at carefully. Is there anything that you do proactively when you go to, whether it's churches or temples or any place that has a religious component to it to make sure that they are following the guidelines of uh, the Department for the Aging? All of our programs have to okay. follow our guidelines. No, I understand if, that. If we have, if we find anyone willfully or insidiously uh, discriminating against anyone, it's something okay. that we will So, so let me change the question for a second. When you provide the training, you provide the training to everyone that you, in terms of inclusivity oh, yeah. and all of that. Um, and if- We haven't provided the training in a while. Okay. We are resuming the training. Okay, so when you resume the training, are the, the people that provide the training, are they on the outlook for different kinds of um, things that would, might come up that might say, hey, this is a problem, or this could be a potential problem, or that kind of thing? Do you I give have, them, do they, have, do they have guidelines that they follow to kind of assess where they are and potential issues? I have the utmost confidence in okay. the training curriculum that SAGE has developed okay. and its various stages. Okay. And that I also have the confidence that if we hear of anything, we take action against it immediately. Right, I'm trying to figure it out before that happens to make sure that these faith-based centers are aware of, I mean, I know they all are, everyone is, but I just, just wanted to flag that, that's all. Yeah, so, of course. Okay. You know? Thank you. It's, I wish we didn't even have to experience this in New York in this day and age. All right, um, Council Member Dinowitz temporarily stepped away, so I think we're going to go back to Chair Kavan for questions. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be back. I just want to note that we did lose quorum for uh, a little bit there, and so I had to, I was again as per the state law um, was removed from being a panelist on the hearing. I uh, was just watching, like the rest of you, um, but grateful to have the opportunity to to ask some more questions. Um, I wanted to move into, I know that my colleague, Chair Hudson had hit some of the, the, the health and, and mental health care pieces, um, wanted to add a little bit of that and, and focus on some of the, the sex uh, health education 
um, piece, you know, one in five people who contract HIV is, is age 50 plus, um, yet sexual health educational programming is not a common feature at, at OACs. And so would, um, and I apologize if this has already been, been covered, but would DIFTA be willing to work with healthcare providers and HIV providers to create LGBTQIA plus inclusive guidance and best practices for providing sex education at city funded um, aging service providers? That's the goal. That, that's, that's the goal that we're working toward. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you could hear me. I feel like we're talking to each other. Uh, <laughs> um, that's the so goal. Close yet so far. Yeah. That is, <laughs> by the way, I like the painting behind your head. Um, oh, yeah. That is, um, that's the goal. You know, the goal is to come up with a training plan that we do exactly that, you know, where, where we could create an environment in as many of our centers uh, as possible. And in addition to that, having these other programs that are natural safe havens for, for, the, for the population. And I mean, what can we do? What can the council do to support and, and facilitate that happening? Um, you could, two things. You could, um, always help us with additional resources. Um, you can help us in our advocacy efforts uh, with the existing resources that are now emerging um, and to be our partner in that, you know, and, and to be a voice with us on the importance of this issue in the community. Great, thank you. Um, and the, the, I'm gonna completely shift uh, topics here a bit, but the, the SAGE programs in, in Harlem and Brooklyn, the, the Stonewall Center, were baselined in the last RFP. RFP, how many total queer-focused NORCs and older adult centers are in the new RFP universe? Say, I didn't hear your question clearly. I know it's something oh, about sorry. how many NORCs. No, it's not you, it's the transmission. Um, how many NORCs and OACs are LGBT? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, how many total, yeah, LGBT or queer focused NORCs and, and OACs are in the, the new uh, RFP universe? Beyond the ones, first of all, every SAGE program that was discretionarily, that was funded by discretionary funds has been baseline. And you'll have my conversation again about how we should repurpose uh, those discretionary dollars back to aging and in, and in some of these targeted areas. Um, so. Um, I, I can give you the actual number. I, I can tell you the ones that we have currently, but we, have, we don't know how many of the other centers may be identified as LGBT or even LGBT sensitive, you know, in terms of the RFP, all right? Is that, this, that sort of answers your question because I don't have a complete answer for you. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in terms of some of the, the I, and I know, again, we've, we've talked about this a lot, and I imagine you end up um, covering this every single time you're up here um, testifying, no matter the kind of population, uh, just because we know that housing insecurity is, is something that is, um, you know, a, a really big challenge and problem for, for all uh, older adults. But obviously, New York City is, is currently experiencing a housing crisis with record homelessness, um, and according to an AARP study, 90% of older adults prefer to age in their homes as opposed to moving to institutional settings. Again, I don't need to tell you this, you are the expert in this. Uh, and moreover, in New York City, nursing homes and retirement communities are prohibitively um, expensive. And so the, I mean, these are, are, are more general, but what is DIFTA doing to assist the rapidly growing older adult and elderly population remain in their, their homes as, as they age? Accounting for the things that you've already mentioned, but if there's anything that that you feel like you've left out that you can put on the record here for us today, and and um, you know, do you do any work to assist lower income older adults to receive accessibility improvements in their home? And then finally, the last piece of this is, um, does dip, dip, uh, DIFTA advocate for prioritizing older New Yorkers for affordable housing? Okay, uh, let me try to unpack all of that. <laughs> all right. So in terms of- I'm worried I'm gonna get knocked off again, so I'm just trying to- I know, no, no, I know you wanna get them all in and I'm gonna to try to answer all of them again. And then whatever I forget, you remind me that you asked me, all right? So we have a five-year strategic community care plan. 
which funds obviously the key services that we know older adults need to stay in their home, right? You've heard me say before, it's about $58,000 to provide wraparound services for an older adult to stay in their home, and it's about $185,000 to keep an old, older per person in a nursing home. It just makes economic sense. Um, the, um, what we've done is, thanks to you, we've been able to increase home-delivered meals. Thanks to you, we've been able to um, expand um, uh, older adult clubs. Um, thanks to you, we've, we're working on transportation. Um, and those are, the, those are some of the basic, and in home care services. And thanks to you, we've been able to increase the number of case management agencies, which is an entree to staying in your community. So those are the things that we've done over with the last year and a half of advocacy. We've been able to increase, and we really are grateful to you for, for that, and also the mental health programs. So that is our plan, to continue that five-year strategic plan. So far, we're in year two. We have year three funded. We need to work on years four and five, um, although food insecurity is handled all the way through year five. That is something that we continue. We have a strong relationship with HPD around affordable housing, uh, around design to keep people in their homes, you know, universal design and uh, working on, on some of those other issues. And in terms of mental health, it's, um, it's about building the cultural competencies and the other mental health programs, but we already have a targeted uh, mental health provider who deals with uh, LGBT, uh, Q, uh, a plus po population. Um, and I forgot your other part of that question. <laughs> I mean, you, you, hit, you hit good uh, pieces of it. I, I think just more specifically, um, the, like, what do y'all do to assist folks with like direct accessibility improvements in their home? Like, I, I know that, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, working with HPD. I'm assuming that has that what you were talking, or maybe I shouldn't assume, but I guess a clarification is were you mostly talking about um, new construction opportunities or does that include folks that are, like, are in their homes that are, are looking to have upgrades get, get made? Yeah. So one of the things that we've been working with, um, and I'm gonna give you another one. One of the things that we've been working with HPD is around universal design, so that um, having them work with older adults who live in uh, HPD run housing to make sure that those are age uh, friendly as much as possible. That's a conversation that we continuously have with them. Uh, we would hope that at some point, and it's, I believe we're close, is to start looking at um, making sure that all city property is, is, is what I call with a universal design because it helps not only older adults, it helps people with disabilities, and it helps families with small children. So that's a conversation. The other conversation we had, again, retaining people in their communities, is that we've worked very closely with the Department of Transportation um, in making sure that um, we've started looking at Vision Zero for our, and created a plan with, in partnership with them. They've created a study that we were very uh, engaged in to make sure that we have vision zero and safety zones around old, uh, around large, in communities with large number of older adults and around um, older adult clubs. And that's one of the things that we continue to work with them. We're also in, in conversations with them about having curb cuts in front of every older adult club. That conversation uh, is still in its very nascent stage. Thank you. And then I, I just want to make one final comment. Um, my understanding is we're going to lose quorum again shortly. And so I think that there may still be some additional questions, but I might not get the opportunity um, to, to, to talk with you directly again during this during this hearing. So I, I mean, I just wanted to, to one, thank you again for your testimony. 
And Commissioner, you, you emphasize that you have to rely on, on your trusted partners, and, and that's really, really great to hear um, because it's those trusted partners like SAGE who are asking for the LGBTQIA plus commission in, in DIPTA in, in spite of the existence of the uh, advisory council. And so I just want to, again, thank you for your thoughtful responses to the questions so far. And I hope that you're able to stay for the remainder of the hearing to hear public testimony uh, around the pre-considered um, introduction. And with that, I will pass it back over to Chair yeah. Hudson. But in addition to SAGE, we work very closely with Queens Community House, the Pride Center, and GRIOT. So, you know, but around training and some of our um, main programming to elevate this conversation and to expand this conversation, to go back to the chair's commitment or my commitment to the chair, that we will make sure that older adults who are LGBTQIA plus have safe havens and that when we age and when you age, you'll still, you'll be able to have some place to go to. Um, but that's, that's something that we will continue working um, with you on. So I thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Caban, and thank you, Commissioner. And I appreciate you uh, calling out the, the budget wins because we worked very, very hard to ensure that um, older adults had, you know, all the things they need and that was in our, you know, through, through partnership with you and your team, so um, thank you. I have one last question, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the council, who I think will then get into um, the public panels. But in 2016, the council passed Local Law 128 that requires DIFTA and other agencies to provide all persons served by the agency with a demographic information survey that contains questions regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. To date, has DIFTA administered this survey? We're in compliance with that, and because we started collecting data voluntarily, but we will uh, continue to that. We are in compliance with that, yes. Okay, okay. and what's been the response rate? Any idea? No, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay, and then um, what challenges has DIFTA found in administering the survey? Getting people to respond. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have to work on that. Um, and then just lastly to Council Member Richardson Jordan's question, this, the data collected by this survey should have the LGBTQIA plus disaggregated. Yeah. So the L, the G, the B. Yeah. So I want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we will work with you in partnership with that discretionary money that you still have left uh, to come up with uh, ways that we could address those things. Okay. <laughs> um, and so if you're, if you're in compliance, then presumably we can get access to um, those reports and that data. Sure. Okay. We'll give you. Should be publicly available. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check and then we'll see what we have and then when we could make a commitment to give you more data. Great. Um, thank you so much for your testimony um, and for all the information that you've uh, been able to provide us with today. I hope you're able to stay for the public panel, but I know it's now 12 o'clock, so after 12 o'clock, so thank you. Thank you, really. I, I, I enjoyed this opportunity, and I look forward to working with you on the intent of the intro. Um, and also encourage you to look at the structures that are currently exist. Again, to your point, to making sure that we're inclusive and that we create, create as many safe havens as possible. We do that structurally. So thank you. All right. Okay, uh, we will now begin public testimony. Uh, and the first panel that we're going to have for public testimony um, will be Arthur Fitting from VNS Health, Elena Waldman from Trans Latinx Network, Dr. Mark Brennan Ng from the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging at Hunter College, Kevin Jones from AARP New York, and Paul Nagel from the Stonewall Community Development Corporation. I believe we have Arthur in person.
Okay, um, and um, each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Um, so you'll begin your testimony once the sergeant announces that your time is starting. Sir? I just want to make sure, okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on health disparities in the old LGBTQ plus New Yorkers. On behalf of VNS Health, formerly known as the Visiting Nurse Service of New York, my name is Arthur Fitting. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am a gay cisgender man who's experienced discrimination in the healthcare system. I'm a nurse and have worked with VNS Health for 30 years in various roles. And I am now the program manager of the LGBTQ plus program at VNS Health. For over 126 years, our organization has provided high quality, cost effective care to underserved and marginalized communities throughout New York who are otherwise shut out of the healthcare system. VNS Health has been a trailblazer in LGBT home and community based care for decades. We lower the institutional barriers to care by meeting our patients where they are most, in their own homes and communities. To advance our efforts in supporting and caring for this vulnerable community, we fully support the establishment of a commission on LGBTQ plus old adults within the Department for Aging. We believe that the development of this commission, with its goal being to identify challenges, share best practices, and develop expert recommendations on ways to improve the quality of life of LGBTQ plus old adults will help us provide, help providers come to consensus on what actions need to be taken to best support our LGBTQ plus old adults in New York City. <clears throat> uh, sorry. Uh, we also want to thank the City Council for providing $200,000 to our gender affirmation program and for targeting the 1.5 for LGBT senior ser services in every borough in the New York City fiscal year 23 budget. Okay. New York State is a home to over 800,000 LGBTQ plus adults, the vast majority in New York City of whom one third are over 50 years old, but only a fraction of these people has the information about and access to services such as home care and hospice care. Not all are aware that there are medical professionals who, are, who will respect and celebrate their unique identity, and many may be wary of the healthcare system due to discrimination, bias, and other negative experiences. Venus Health is the largest healthcare organization in New York with the Sage Care Platinum LGBT cultural competency credential, meaning more than 80% of our staff, including in hospice, home care, and behavioral health, has received training in working with LGBTQ plus communities. The training helps ensure that our team members are aware of and sensitive to the needs and concerns of LGBTQ plus old adults. This creates a safe space in the patient's home by providing cultural competent care. VNS Health LGBTQ plus community outreach brings education resources and training about LGBTQ plus health to communities throughout and beyond New York City. Working with the LGBTQ outreach works with more than 100 community based organizations and healthcare partners to increase awareness of LGBTQ plus issues and health needs. VNS Health serves the population with our LGBTQ care type which is a data-driven model that helps identify social risk factors such as race, income, housing stability, caregiver support, so we can address these factors when providing care. We can then work with LGBTQ plus culturally competent CBOs to ensure our patients get care they need in a safe, welcoming environment. The process starts with our trained staff observing for those who are self-identifying as LGBTQ plus. Uh, once the patient receives the initial welcome call from the Viennese Health, our LGBT program manager introduces them to a variety of services offered within the program, including LGBTQ plus health education and connection to local community-based organizations 
in their area linked to additional resources and services. Patients undergoing gender affirmation transition are particularly vulnerable, making their care during and after surgery critically important. In 2016, VNS Health created a groundbreaking program known as the Gender Affirmation Program, dedicated to transgender and non-binary post-surgical patients, the only program of its kind in the U.S. VNS Health's Gender Affirmation Program, known as GAP, has provided home care to over 1,400 patients and expects to provide care to over 250 patients in 2022. With more than 450 healthcare providers trained in the cultural and nuances of caring for gender affirmation surgery patients, VNS Health GAP role begins upon the patient's discharge from the hospital following gender affirmation surgery. Our clinicians come into their homes and provide affirming care. These clinicians are trained in culturally competency as well as post-surgical care for the gender affirming sur surgery. <clears throat> VNS Health has long been a forefront of caring for people with HIV AIDS. Since the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, we have provided compassionate care in the home to thousands of New Yorkers living with HIV AIDS. Today, nearly half of the people living with HIV in the United States are over the age of 50 and many face unique needs as they get older. The increase in new cases in, is in men age 55 and above. But the basic premise for living longer has not changed. If the HIV virus can be suppressed in a person's system, they will not develop AIDS. But compliance with medications, treatment, and following up appointments for the older adult living with HIV AIDS can be complicated by social risk factors. Our HIV special needs Medicaid health plan has the highest rate of viral load suppression in New York City because of how we effectively manage the health of our members living with HIV. Conclusion. Thank you again for giving me the op opportunity to testify today. We appreciate the Council's leadership on facing LGBTQ plus old adults. VNS Health hopes to continue to work closely with City Council and community-based organizations to provide high-quality, cultural competent care to this population. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Elena Waldman. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, good, good afternoon. I guess my name is Elena Waldman. I work at TransLatinx Network. I, am, I use they, them pronouns. I'm a non-binary, femme-presenting, queer baby boomer. Try putting that on an intake form. Um, I don't want to repeat things that were already said, but I do want to expe express my immense gratitude for the thoughtfulness and clarity that was uh, brought today by uh, all of the folks from the City Council and DIFTA and the comments around the room. Um, two of the things that really uh, uh, present themselves to me are issues of violence and cultural competency that older, I use the word queer, it includes all of us. I apologize if somebody feels uncomfortable with that. Um, the, the violence and cultural competency issues facing queer folks. Um, as we know, and as a, has already been stated, queer folks experience street violence, not just because they're older, but also because we're queer, and we get targeted, especially um, folks who do not seem to comport with gender norms or folks who are, quote, obviously queer. Um, we can all speak volumes about that, I'm sure. I'd like to focus a little bit about cultural competency and the intersection of that to what we were speaking of today. Um, I live in a Nork. We have a beautiful little Nork center there. There are about 12 or 15 of us queer folks uh, who kind of hang out together. We don't go there. One of the reasons why we don't go there is because, not that the staff there are unwelcoming, they're lovely, but the cultural competency training that gets done is to the staff. And although we would like to think that that gets passed on to the participants, that's not always what happens. What does happen is as trans and queer folk, we walk into a place like that and we become the cultural competency trainers, which means that I can't participate without having to wear several hats, explaining my gender identity, um, 
explaining the use of non-conforming pronouns, talking about your queerness. So what one of the things that I think would be really helpful is training the trainers. In other words, if we are training staff at older adult centers, how do we train the staff to train the participants so that everybody feels welcome and doesn't feel like they have to wear the mantle of trainer? Um, I think that that's a one small but important component. Um, I also want to address the issue of cultural Time competence. expired. Oh, thank you all very much. Have a great day. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Mark Brennan Ng. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Mark Brennan Ng. I use they and them pronouns. I'm the Director of Research and Evaluation at the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging. We are CUNY's Aging Research and Policy Center and part of Hunter College. Thank you, Chairpersons Hudson and Caban and members of the committee for holding this oversight hearing and the opportunity to provide testimony on this important topic. My scholarship focuses on the socio-emotional challenges facing LGBTQIA plus older adults and the critical role of behavioral health on efforts to combat the HIV AIDS epidemic. As a sexual minority person who came of age during the HIV epidemic and who has known many who have faced the challenge of HIV infection and many who have died from the disease, this is also a very personal issue to me. For older New Yorkers, a lack of sexual health education is a barrier to getting tested for HIV. Medical providers often do not address sexual health issues with older patients, and do not have conversations about them about HIV and other STI risks. As a result, older people are more likely to be infected with HIV years before being diagnosed and are more likely to receive a dual diagnosis of HIV and AIDS when they are diagnosed. In 2018, the latest year for which we have data, 17% of new HIV infections were among people 50 and older. At the same time, due to successful treatment, over 50% of people living with HIV today are age 50 and older. And according to the CDC, 60% of these people are gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Thus, there are two separate reasons why the HIV epidemic is now a majority 50-plus phenomena, new cases due to ignored, unprotected sexual activity, and increased survival of people who got HIV at younger ages. HIV infection does not inevitably lead to AIDS and is no longer the death sentence that was at the start of the epidemic. Increasingly, sophisticated antiretroviral therapy, or ART, has lowered the share of HIV-positive people whose infection progresses to AIDS by keeping viral loads undetectable. Our research finds that Black people living with HIV are particularly overrepresented among those whose viral loads are consistently unsuppressed. Diagnoses of depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and other mental health problems are all associated with consistently unsuppressed viral load status. Why is this of concern? Depression is one of the strongest predictors of non-adherence to ART and other medical treatments. Alcohol and substance use not only interfere with ART adherence, but also reduce the effectiveness of ART in controlling HIV. Our research on older people with HIV finds that over 60% suffer from clinically significant symptoms. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll move on to Kevin Jones. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members, Hudson and Kaban, and members uh, of the committees on aging and women and gender equity. My name is Kevin Jones, and I'm the Associate State Director of Advocacy at AARP New York, and I'm here today on behalf of our 750,000 New York City members. I'm truly honored to be able to testify at this historic hearing the first focus on the needs of LGBTQIA plus older adults. As you know, New York City has a large and active LGBTQ plus community, and a lot of them are older adults. Of the estimated 800,000 LGBTQIA adults in New York State, 28% are over the age of 50, and because the older population is growing 12 times faster than, young, than the younger demographics, we can expect the number of older LGBTQ plus adults to swell. Although New York City has been one of the most welcoming and supportive places for members of the LGBTQIA community, 
We have found that LGBTQ plus older people remain largely invisible and face unique challenges in aging, including discrimination that is compounded by race. Disparities are in fact often compounded and thus even greater, uh, <clears throat> even greater for the estimated one in five LGBTQIA older people of color. Analysis from AARP shows that older New Yorkers of color face significant disparities in health, economic security, and livable communities. In AARP's report, Disrupting Disparities, Solutions for LGBTQ New Yorkers 50 Plus, which we developed in partnership with, partnership with SAGE, we found that LGBTQ plus older people experience a range of disparities relative to non-LGBTQ older people, including increased rates of disability, poor physical and mental health, alcohol and tobacco use, and HIV. LGBTQ plus New Yorkers over 50 report frequent mental distress, palatable depression, and frequent poor physical health. And transgender New Yorkers of all ages are nearly 50% more likely to be uh, report being in fair or poor health when compared to non-transgender respondents, even when controlling for age and education. In 2017, more, peop uh, more than half of people living with HIV in New York State were over age 50. A survey released by AARP last week reaffirms and expands our findings. 49% of LGBTQ survey respondents were either extremely or very concerned about having enough money and social supports to rely on as they age. 52% report being socially isolated and 22% see mental health professionals for depression or anxiety. In addition to family and social supports, LGBTQ adults also report concerns about having their financial security as they age. The vast majority of respondents, about 85%, are at least somewhat concerned about having enough income or savings to retire, with the highest concern among respondents who are ages 50, 50, excuse me, 45 to 54, black, and transgender or non-binary. Additionally, 35% evaluated their financial situation as fair or poor. Older adults Time across expired. all segments of the community uh, have anxiety over discrimination and the negative impact it may have as they age. Um, I, uh, I know I'm out of time. I want to say that we do support uh, the legislation that was introduced um, at this hearing, and I will support. I will be uh, submitting uh, a longer testimony online. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, and we'll be moving to Paul Nagel. Time starts now. My name is Paul Nagel, he, him, his, and I have the privilege of serving as Executive Director for Stonewall Community Development Corporation. Our mission is to see New York City's LGBTQ older adults in safe, welcoming housing they can afford with access to health and mental health services that meet their unique needs. Thank you to Chairs Hudson and Caban for representing the issues so well in your opening remarks. A lack of ability to self-identify as LGBTQIA plus at point of service makes us invisible to both the state and the city. There's no data, there's no public policy issue. Correcting this will need to be affected through clear and enforceable city and state legislation. There have been several unsuccessful attempts. In fact, Councilmember Drom passed such legislation in 2016, intro 552A, but to my knowledge, none of the agencies required to formulate schemas for such LGBTQIA plus data collection have done so. I would love to be proved wrong on that, but to date, that data appears to be unavailable. Stonewall Community Development Corporation stands ready to assist uh, in any way we can in passing such legislation, and we're already in conversation with people at the state level about this. Another issue is the way Department for the Aging has structured its funding streams through the new RPs, which preclude us from getting funding, even though we are very much providing services. Many seniors do not use senior centers, and the naturally occurring retirement community funds are geographically based. We are not a physical center. We build our constituency from on the ground organizing, allow us to reach folks who don't go to centers and aren't comfortable seeking services in their local NARCs for all the reasons we've been exploring today. Previous aging chair Margaret Trin was visionary in recognizing the importance of our approach. We're still getting discretionary, discretionary allocations, but are precluded from this new RFP even though we are very much providing services. I suspect we are not the only community-based service provider experiencing this. In closing, as an elder gay man, I remember in 1986 when Bell Telephone finally allowed the words lesbian and gay to be used in the phone book. Imagine how hard organizing had been in light of that obstacle, and yet we did. I am a survivor of full-blown AIDS. I'm alive to testify today because I joined DARE, a local buyers club, and illegally bought a second antiretroviral from France. As LGBTQIA plus folks, we are a community with a shared lived experience, a history of building community networks of support, and an incredible collective imagination. Equality and freedom was a collective imagination that we made real. We know how to get things done. Imagine if the city had the same resource. We look forward to working with you, sharing our knowledge, our work, and our proposals. 
thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm good. Thank you, panel, for your testimony. We'll be moving to our second panel now. Um, so on our second panel, we have, um, and I apologize for any mispronunciation, uh, Lynn Faria, um, Leticia Millard Bethia, Jose Colazzo, Joanna Rivera, and R.E. Lunderman, all from SAGE. And just a reminder that um, for the panelists, please wait for the cue from the Sergeant at Arms to begin speaking. Also, when you hear the, uh, the beep, that means that your time has expired. Good morning, Chair Hudson and Chair Kaman and the members of the Aging and um, Women and Gender Equity Committees. Thank you so much for hosting today's hearing and a huge thank you to your staff, to the committee staff, and to all of the members and my colleagues, both from SAGE and within the movement for uh, testifying today. My name's Lynn Ferry, as you heard. I use she or they pronouns, and I'm the executive vice president at SAGE, which is the country's largest and oldest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ plus older people and HIV affected older people. We're truly making history today. This, it's so fitting that we're hosting, that you're hosting this, uh, this hearing in Pride Month, where 53 years ago, a group of activists stood up to the harassment, discrimination, and bigotry that they felt and blazed the trails for today's movement for LGBTQ equality. Those, those activists, among those activists who were, who were lucky enough to, to survive um, those 53 years, those are today's elders. And those are the folks who we're talking about today. And as you've heard today, they deserve our support. I'm not gonna be repetitive because I have a number of colleagues on who are gonna talk about particular issues, but I do wanna lift up what you've heard today, which is we're talking about a population of older people who are far less likely to have children and far more likely to live alone and often disconnected from family support systems. This is what makes aging services provided through the city so crucial. And as we've heard, fears of discrimination, actual lived experience discrimination often preclude LGBTQ plus older people from actually accessing the services to which they're entitled. And we know that elders of color and trans older folks face even greater disparities and deeper challenges to access. SAGE recommends the following policies to address some of these issues. One is to require that all city aging services, long-term supports, housing services, and community-based, home and community-based services receive training in LGBTQ plus cultural competency. As the commissioner indicated, we've had conversations about that and look forward to working with her in enacting those. Including questions about sexual orientation and gender identity wherever those demographic questions are asked. And that includes in some of the databases that city contractors are required to report in. So we can start to really truly see the needs of this community and expand LGBTQ plus and age competent mental health services to address the issues that so many older adults struggle with. Uh, SAGE also supports the legislation introduced today. Thank you both. We look forward Time to- Time expired. Uh, we look forward to working with the chairs as well as with DIFTA about the best way to implement this. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. And then we're moving on to uh, Leticia Millard Bethia. Starting time. Starting time. Hey, thank you. Good, morning, good afternoon. My name is Leticia Malarbathia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Director of Resident Services at SAGE. I oversee the city's, our city's first two LGBTQ plus welcoming development, Wall House in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, and 
the Cortona Pride House in East Tremont neighborhood in the Bronx. LGBTQ older people face significant barriers to, to accessing safe, affordable, and welcoming housing. Due to fears of discrimination, 34% of LGBTQ older pe LGBTQ plus older people and 54% of transgender older adults fear having to recloset themselves when seeking elder housing. Furthermore, countless LGBTQ I plus uh, older adults finding themselves priced out of neighborhoods in which they've lived in lived for many years due to rising rents and financial insecurity as they age. Unless effectively addressed, this housing crisis among LGBTQ plus older adults will only worsen as the population of both older New Yorkers and out LGBTQ plus elders continue to grow. Stonewall House and Cortona Pride House helped to alleviate this crisis and these two buildings combined offer 228 LGBTQ plus friendly elder housing units. The units are supported by project-based Section 8 rental subsidies from NYCHA, which restricts the income of eligible elders to 50% of the area, uh, area median income. A portion in each building are also set aside for formerly homeless elders. SAGE also receives funding from New York City's Senior Rental Assistance Program, or SARA, for two housing staff positions in each building. But the needs of our residents often outstrip, outstrip the capacity of the housing staff. These include physical and mental health care, loneliness and isolation, food, and food security, and overall well-being as well as support navigating social services benefits, such as the complication and stressful annual recertification process for Section 8 vouchers. There's also a growing need for 24-hour security at these buildings and other elder housing in the city. The particular need for the elder in the face of escalating anti-LGBTQ and racist violence. A strongly encourages the preservation of existing affordable elder housing and the creation of more Time LGBTQ. Letitia, you can finish your testimony. LGBT, thank you. LGBTQ plus affirming housing options. In addition, we want to elevate the need for increased housing staff to best support the SARA funded developments. We look forward to working with the city to ensure that the housing needs of LGBT, LGBTQ plus elders and these communities can be fully addressed and explore the options to ensure that senior housing across the city is safe through 24 hour security. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify on these important issues. Thank you very much. We're moving on to Jose Colazzo. Oh. Starting time. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm mute, unmuted, okay. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Colazzo. I am the site director at State Center Bronx, located at the ground uh, floor at the Cortona Pride House. And uh, yeah, I'm really honored every day when I come to work because I am among the original pioneers of the LGBT rights movement um, that paved the road so that we can openly be who we are. Uh, each station is unique and is catered to the community that they're rooted in. For example, in the Bronx, we have a, a, a large Spanish speaking population. And so our, we have services and events in Spanish. And in Brooklyn stage, um, there is a large Asian population where we offer program services in Mandarin and Cantonese. Uh, for LGBT elders of color in particular, it is incredibly important that LGBTQ plus aging services are available in culturally and linguistically competent manner. Currently, there are still English proficient LGBT, LGBTQ plus elders that are be, not being reached in New York City. One role that a commission within DIFSA on LGBTQ plus aging can play is identifying these gaps and working to ensure services are LGBTQ plus competent and accessible to elders who come from different cultures and speak different languages other than English. 
to help in defining these services gap in immigrant communities and communities of color, the city must collect data on these populations. SAGE recommend that the city starts incorporating voluntary questions about sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression on all the forms where Democrat, the demographic uh, information is already collected, such as age and race. Many LGBT plus elders of color enter retirement age in a financial precarious position. They also face additional social uh, uh, detriment of health, such as poverty, unemployment, racism, um, that further limit access to healthcare and healthy living. One of the top concerns in the state center Bronx participants is access to fresh produce and other nutritional services, an issue for many area cities that are considered food deserts. We're currently in a food desert where the uh, nearest uh, place to find uh, fresh fruits and vegetables might be the bodega uh, across the street. And if you've seen that tomato on Tuesday, you're more likely going to see it on Friday. Um, uh, while this the grab and go meal program was created as an emergency in response to COVID-19, uh, it has proven to be vital resources to our community members. Recently, SAGE has piloted food pantries at all three of the centers. Uh, the response has been overwhelming. and many of our centers, we have lines around the block. Uh, if our discretionary funding was more flexible outside of DIFTA standard expense contract template, SAGE could better provide supplement nutrition. Time expired. Food and pensions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we'll be moving on to Joanna Rivera. Starting time. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairs Hudson and Caban, for hosting this extremely important conversation. My name is Joanna Rivera. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the manager of transgender and non binary outreach and community engagement at SAGE. So I work specifically with transgender and non-binary older adults, age 50 plus. The health disparities, violence, and discrimination that transgender and non-binary elders or TGNB elders face even up to this day is unaccept uh, unacceptable and their needs must be centered when speaking about L older LGBTQ plus New Yorker needs. SAGE's TGNB elder participants have had horrifying experiences that they shared with us and that have impacted their abilities to age with dignity and respect, the dignity and respect that they deserve. Trans elders have been denied medical care. Um, you know, a, a lot of us have seen those TV shows about the drastic measures that have that transgender people have gone to to become themselves, one of them being injecting free-flowing silicone into the body. That, that is a real community, and that is a community that we're serving at SAGE that is speaking up about health needs and they have been denied medical needs because of, of the things that they've had to do to become themselves. Um, many TGNB elders um, are also facing a lot of street harassment, public transportation harassment, and they're sharing this with us. And as shared during this meeting earlier, um, LGBTQ people travel um, further than their uh, local communities for programming that are know knows that they're coming. One example of that is our transgender programming at SAGE. We do have a transgender and non-binary aging community at SAGE, and, and they travel from all over to these programs because we're the ones that are expecting them. We're saying our transgender and non-binary elders are coming. They need these resources. At SAGE, we actually serve um, transgender community age 50 plus, even though DIFTA is 60 plus, and it is because of the, of the different needs. Our transgender and non-binary elders, many of them don't have faces that are gonna be welcoming to them. One example of that is like, we've taken our participants places and we're just sitting down having lunch and people are coming and saying, oh, what's happening? Is a show happening? Um, people wanna talk about celebrities and all this stuff. And it's like, no, we're talking about older adults that are just trying to sit down and have lunch. And um, you know, our elders, 65% of TGMB elders report having limited access to care that they deserve. Just like they travel from all over to receive competent care in LGBT-centered, um, older adult centers, um, they're having to travel for medical care. Um, an initial step that can be taken is requiring all city funding aging services, long-term support services, community health care providers, and housing services to receive transgender and non-binary cultural competency training. Th th there is a dire need. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Chair, um, 
if you have any questions. Yes, Lynn, I did have a quick question, if that's okay. Um, just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, the current uh, commission that DIFTA has and then the proposed bill um, that we have to create. Um, how will these be different from your perspective? Thank you so much for that question, Chair Hudson. Um, from from what I understand, from the uh, uh, from what uh, from what I understand, the existing advisory council within DIFTA could actually be a vehicle to elevate LGBTQ plus uh, elder voices. I would say that the number can be uh, limiting uh, if we're talking two per borough to really ensure a full spectrum of diversity. You know, in some ways it's not an either or, it can be a both and, and to really look to, you know, a commission. I really look to partner with, with you, Chair Hudson, Chair Caban, and Commissioner Cortez Vazquez as to like, what is the best vehicle to make sure that there is a comprehensive look by the city at the needs of LGBTQ plus older people, you know, in all five boroughs, you know, recognizing and, and lifting up you know, how intersectionality plays into, you know, the experiences of, of that community within the city and, and what are some of the remedies and solutions that we can put forward? You know, we've, we've, you know, we've obviously elevated issues related to, you know, racial intersectionality, folks living, uh, folks of trans and non-binary experience, and also, uh, we also should lift up issues related to ability and disability uh, so, you know, in terms of, of how this gets implemented, certainly, you know, look to have deeper conversations, you know, with you and, and DIFTA, and perhaps there could be room for both. Thank you. Uh, and then I apologize, we do have one more panelist, um, R.E. Lunderman, I apologize. Starting time. Good afternoon, my name is Ree Lunderman, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the program manager of Sage Positive at Sage. Sage Positive works with and creates programming for LGBTQ plus people over the age of 50 that are living with and impacted by HIV. Our programming is directly influenced by the community and we see firsthand the necessity of the city's involvement to increase the availability of services and training in order to improve the care of aging New Yorkers living with HIV. This has been mentioned, but I want to reemphasize three out of every five people in the New York City metropolitan area living with HIV is 50 years of age or older. That is 60% of those living with HIV are 50 or older, a population that makes up of nearly 80,000 New Yorkers with people of color making up 77% of this aging community. We believe that public discourse should not only center ending the HIV epidemic, but we must also center the needs of those who are currently living with HIV the aging community has experienced incredible erasure, and we hope that this will change moving forward. We're here to highlight the increased challenges that continue to present themselves, challenges to a system of HIV care that was not initially designed to address these complex needs, challenges that we believe need to be prioritized. Older people living with HIV are more likely to be diagnosed with depression and a multitude of comorbidities. Participants in Sage Positive share that they continue to face immense social stigma and isolation, continue to experience providers who lack an understanding of the lived experiences of long-term survivors. All of these factors contribute to an urgent need for more culturally competent care. We believe redesigning the existing service models is imperative to improve the quality of life among older persons living with HIV while ensuring that healthcare and psychosocial services remain accessible and manageable. We recommend that the city promote and fund programming that has the goal of increasing collaboration between HIV providers and aging providers in order to create more effective approaches to improving the health and well being of the community. An example includes increased collaboration and case conferencing between the HIV providers and aging providers, as well as the expansion of existing industry led programs and services. We recommend that there be a requirement for all staff, subcontractors, subgrantees, volunteers of city-funded aging services, long-term support services, home and community-based services, and housing services to receive at least a minimum level of training on providing care and support to the older New Yorkers living with HIV. The aging community living with HIV in New York City will only continue to grow. 
We're hopeful that the city will take today's recommendations into consideration and move forward with the goal of improving the care and services available to our older community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, panel. Um, we will be moving on to our next panel. Just a reminder that if you are testifying in person, please to fill out um, an appearance card. Um, so on our next panel, we will have Tanya Walker, Bill Meehan, uh, Lujira Cooper, David Martin, and Richard Daniels. And you'll please wait for the uh, cue from the Sergeant at Arms to begin speaking. Starting time. Tanya, Tanya Walker. Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this important conversation and also letting me testify on behalf of the uh, LGBTQ or TGNCNB, transgender, gender non-conforming, non-binary community uh, about housing. I'm a combat engineer's army veteran. I am the co-founder of New York Transgender Advocacy Group, uh, and I'm on the advisory board at Equality New York. In the past, I worked as a case manager I, I worked with homeless or houseless single families and TGNC and B single adults. Um, I'm happy to be able to testify today. Uh, I stand on the shoulders of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. You know, what is needed uh, in the community that I've seen, boots on the ground, is uh, like someone said in the past, better data collection, um, uh, which with demographics that reflects all of our identities uh, in the TGNC community or gender expansive community, uh, so that funding will go to our most vulnerable here in society. Uh, too many in our community are falling through the cracks and some have died. We do not have data on how many gender expansive or TGNCMB, transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary folks uh, have died as a result of COVID-19. We do not know uh, how many houseless or homeless people living with HIV uh, oh, and who are experiencing significant mental health issues or substance use issues currently. Uh, I live in a rent regulated apartment uh, and I fear that one day, you know, due to the high cost of living, I may uh, be a homeless veteran on the streets. Uh, uh, I think we need more low income housing for, uh, for uh, TGNC and B folks transgender non-conforming and non-binary folks in New York. Uh, Cause when you say affordable, affordable to who? So I say low income, which would, uh, which would target a specific population in our city of older adults who are, who may be uh, close to homelessness. Uh, I think there needs to be some type of pre prevention dollars in place Time expired. Uh, to help folks so they don't end up homeless on the streets one day. Um, I think that uh, we need like a transgender center, uh, international se educational center here in New York, where folks can come, around, come from around the world to get educated about trans people, since all the hate that's out there in society on the, on the so-called right is against transgender children and transgender people, adults. Um, I think that this center should be uh, a model for the world to see that we are just like everyone else. Um, you know, we, you know, we get educated, we, 
we live our lives as who we are and we're born who we are and that gender identity is in your mind. It's not in your sexual organs, like most people tend to think. And that, you know, so people will take us more seriously. Currently, uh, as far as housing is concerned, again, we need, uh, we need transgender expansive people need safe housing and safe spaces, you know, with culturally competent residents and staff who need cultural competency training on a regular basis, even some of the LGBTQ community uh, need this training, several. Um, I know a lot of people like to can use the language good, but some people need that training because they do still do have a fear of being around us, you know, being around trans people or gender expansive folks. Um, the types of housing that we currently need uh, we need congregate housing. We need transitional and permanent housing. Uh, in the congregate housing, we need uh, wraparound services in it. And in the transitional housing, uh, those are for folks who have moved on, who are currently attending college, and who are about are or who are are seniors, and uh, and then they can move on to permanent housing because everybody doesn't have life skills. Everyone doesn't, even if they're senior, everyone doesn't know how to, how to pay bills, how to uh, work a credit card or, or how, to, how to, you know, to live their lives, how to cook, how to clean. Many of our folks have been homeless mostly all of their lives. And some are experiencing, you know, significant mental health issues, like I said, and they may need that extra help. Oh, hello. Uh, most uh, will need this extra help so they can move into permanent housing, permanent, you know, uh, low income housing, and then maybe one day they can move to afford, you know, affordable housing uh, in the future. Because most of us weren't lucky enough to complete our education. Time expired. I don't know who's written my. I'm sorry. Somebody keeps ringing my bell. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, very, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I'm going to be uh, moving on. Thank you. Thank moving you. on to Bill Meehan. Starting time. Good day. Happy Pride to all. Thank you to both uh, chairs Hudson and Kavan for hosting this very historic meeting. I applaud the idea. Uh, by the way, I'm a gay senior residing in Sage's Stonewall House in Brooklyn in Council District 35. And I applaud the idea of creating a commission within the Department of Aging to address the needs of senior LGBTQIA plus senior communities. And I hope that this, this commission will have a majority of people from that community on it. Our voices are necessary. I also applaud the recent increase in minimum wage not a be all or an end all solution, but definitely a step in the right direction. Um, an increase in wages will drive prices up and that will have a negative effect on those of us on fixed incomes. Uh, this is not an either or issue. Both groups are very much in need. Seniors in your district, both gay and straight, seniors on SSI pensions, um, will see their purchasing power decrease by a rise in prices. This needs to be addressed and remedies need to be found or we in effect will create a new class of poverty. Many of us are not qualified for Medicaid but not rich enough to pay for medical services. For example, shingle shots are $190 a piece, nearly $400 out of pocket for needed protection. Seniors need assistance in getting needed inoculations. Because of a lack of elevators and escalators, subways aren't as accessible as needed, and we need to ride the bus. Multiple transfers in a system that only allows one free transfer. We shouldn't have to pay extra because the city failed to, to meet ADA compliance. Section 8 needs to be expanded. We need to use Section 8 to keep us seniors in place. It will allow us to do that. We need to be more aggressive in seeing that landlords 
except Section 8. LGBTQIA plus seniors need safe and secure housing. 24-hour security in senior buildings shouldn't be looked at as a luxury, but as a necessity. LGBTQ seniors don't, be, uh, some of the stuff that we need don't really require miracles. They need attention. As a society, as a city, we have the means. We need to find the determination. And for that, we need your voice. Be our voice with your state and federal colleagues. Together, we can do the right thing and not only identify senior needs, but address them. Thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony today. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll be moving on to Lujira Cooper. Starting time. Good, much, good afternoon, and thank you all for allowing me to testify. Mayor Dinkins once said, New York is a mosaic, not a melting pot. It is an interlocking, inter, can't speak, interlocking portrait of, of the world, and these pieces need New York City to support all its senior citizens as we age. However, the LGBTQ plus community, more now with the rancor going throughout the country, needs to feel valued, safe, and free. The city council can show us it cares by training and cultural competency in all senior centers and creating additional ones. When I was houseless, Sage Midtown was a lifesaver. It gave me a place to go until I could return to a drop-in shelter. Counselors spoke to me about options and all staff made me feel valued. Many seniors, because of the pandemic, became more isolated. The closures felt like abandonment with curtailed activities such as congregate lunches, dinners, and places to meet friends and partake in activities. As elders, we need to know these are safe places. Isolation, the pandemic and family loss or rejection makes aging unbearable. As an elder, I have no family to support me, nor console me except my chosen ones through Sage and Darot. The meager grants from government for LGBTQ plus programs lead to isolation and fear of visibility. The Department for the Aging needs to create a standing commission for training to deal with LGBTQ seniors and the, with the physical and mental health issues along with social and wellness programs. LGBTQ elders plus in this mosaic of New York need to relief through affordable housing, health services, physical and mental and safe spaces. We need to know New York cares. Invisibility is death. So to quote Sage's motto, we refuse to be invisible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're moving on to David Martin. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak as a member of Sage. I am a consumer health advocate long-term survivor of 35 years and a same gender loving man. My concerns are about the programs and services provided to aging persons with HIV. People with HIV over 50 make up the majority of the total HIV population in New York City. To date, the medical community has focused on achieving viral load suppression and managing HIV as is appropriate. However, 40 years into this epidemic, and there seemed to be no anticipation of or plan to address needs when HIV and aging converge. The medical community seemed to have had a wait and see mindset without foresight for this population. What is known is HIV acceleration is causing patients to age more rapidly than the general population, approximately 10 to 15 years. Providers need to consider conducting age-related assessments and screenings much earlier. Aging persons with HIV are likely to face increased stigma, comorbidities, isolation, and can easily fall out of care without it being noticed. They often do not have children or family support, especially in the LGBTQIA community. There are inequities in data collection, surveillance of, health, of the health of same gender loving women and bisexual women does not exist. 
These are other, these among other priority populations are vulnerable, making ending the epidemic unattainable. Health systems, healthcare systems should be able to find and retain patients who are out of care. There is no formal effort to support achieving this aspect of the ETE. Providers should focus on developing partnerships with their patients. It's important to have trust to garner disclosures and agreements in support of patients' treatment. Patients are integral to providers successfully achieving care goals. Assessments of ACEs or adverse childhood experiences should be executed to identify persons who may be predisposed to poor health outcomes. In a Kaiser Permanente study, subjects who were white had high scores. It's estimated that persons of brown and black communities would surpass these high scores based on the ongoing societal persecutions and substandard quality of care. Oral health is crucial to aging persons with HIV, to masticate food and support proper nutrition. Dental standards are low and often lead to tooth extractions replaced with dentures and partials instead of an allowance for permanent impl implants. These are not cosmetic when tooth loss exists. And finally, patient appointments would provide with providers are way too short to conduct comprehensive exams, Time expired. inquiries, and interactions with patients. Aging per persons with HIV have increased need for geriatric and behavioral health services from culturally similar providers. However, the availability of providers is woefully inadequate with many providers who do not accept insurance. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. We're moving on to Richard Daniels. Starting time. I'm Richard Daniels, 70, married to an older spouse for whom I am now a full-time caregiver and I'm a long-term AIDS survivor with health needs of my own. Caring for an elderly partner facing illness and decline shares some similarities to my previous experience, but the distinction between private medical insurance, insurance, which we had then, and Medicare, which we have now, is blatant as we face what isn't covered. Issues of hearing, dental, vision, prescriptions, alternative therapies, and most crucially, in-home assistance, all those expensive things that aging engenders and requires. Hospital care has been okay, but what are the things to help keep you out of the hospital? I am learning to navigate various social service agencies to help with the care I now provide, SAGE among them. Some have led us to home health aid options, which are very limited, though I'm grateful these agencies have already equipped themselves to deal with LGBTQ clients. We participated in several friendly visitor programs through universities and social service agencies, all of which are valuable to counter isolation. One agency offered a seminar I attended that was to address caregiver support, how to create caring circles. Her first instruction was to appeal to family, siblings, children, etc. While her assumptions had a narrow hetero bias limiting her program's application, I was reminded how during the AIDS wars, Friends and extended friends were corralled into care groups. Yet at this stage of life, the human resources are much diminished. Most LGBTQ people, for any number of reasons, lack the generational support of younger family upon which to rely. The first time I cared for an ill spouse, I had living parents, even a grandparent, and a much larger circle of friends. That circle is diminishing as our peers retreat to face their own health demands. I have said before that living through the early AIDS era left me with a PhD in grief and loss. It's left other scars as well. Due to COVID's lockdown moment, anyone should be able to identify with the effects of isolation. Couple that with age, physical decline, vulnerability, immobility, and you've got quite a stew. Consider the difficulty of getting around. For one moment early in the pandemic, Project CART was shuttling folks to and from medical appointments. That was fantastic. Now that services is limited to a very confined radiance, radius, with public transport now unfeasible, we spend a fortune on taxis. And it's disconcerting and angering to see them pass you by when they see you with a person using a walker, just as I experienced 30 years ago when I'd be trying to hail a cab with my black partner. Having a strategy to get taxis by hiding the person I'm with has come in handy again. Living with AIDS can exacerbate the effects of aging and disease progression. 
Juggling my need to stay active with the demands of caregiving is often challenged by my PTSD. Time expired. Prior caregiving. Issues of well-being in addition to concrete medical and living needs must be considered. Aging and healthcare services don't always consider this reality. We are treated and seen based on age or based on diagnosis, but hardly ever both identities together. There must be increased coordination between aging services and healthcare providers to ensure older New Yorkers living with AG, HIV are supported. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, panel. We'll be moving on to our next panel. Uh, we'll have in person Linda Hoffman, and then on Zoom, Mark Milano, Jason Chanchato, and Judith Ribnick. Good afternoon, especially to our chairs, Chair Hudson and Chair Caban, and also to the members of this committee. I am Linda Hoffman. I am president of New York Foundation for Senior Citizens, and we applaud the City Council's bill uh, to develop a committee at DIFTA in only in relation to LGBTQ. We're also truly appreciative of the citywide budget funding that the speaker, Speaker Adams has provided, as well as the support for that funding and individual discretionary budget funding that many council members have provided toward our home sharing and respite care program for the next fiscal year. Our program, which provides the only services of their type in New York City, has been helping seniors of all ethnic, racial and religious backgrounds, income levels and sexual orientations for the last 42 years. While we celebrate gay pride this month, we're especially appreciative of your pri prioritizing the issue of equity for our city's LGBTQ population, 60,000 of whom have self-identified and many of them are seniors. They are struggling to survive on Social Security, as we've said earlier. They live alone and require, and have, uh, require services and have no supports. Our mission is to enable such vulnerable populations to remain healthy and safe in their own homes. And along with home sharing and in-home respite care, we offer ISEP home care and numerous other social services, as well as affordable and homeless housing for older LGBT populations. Our free home sharing service matches adult hosts who have extra spaces in their apartments or homes to share with responsible, compatible adults, who we call guests, in need of affordable housing. One of the matchmates must be over the age of 60. And over the past four decades, we have successfully matched 2,500 persons in 1,250 shared living arrangements. And just last week, our staff matched a married male couple in their, who are in their 60s who are sharing their Upper West Side apartment with a woman in her 60s. Speaking of the need for housing for the LGBT population, this is a population that we are serving with home sharing as well as with respite care, which provides affordable short-term in-home care at the low cost of $15 per hour for frail elderly who are attempting to manage at home um, with the help of uh, others or on their own. And um, this, this type of service um, has been provided again um, for over almost 10,000 older adults over the last 42 years and thousands of their caregivers. This also serves the LGBT population. I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you um, for being so supportive of this and that this is a very important affordable housing option and it really works and thank you for recognizing it and I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention and we want to work together with you to make sure that we reach everyone in the LGBT community uh, who requires these services. Thank you so much. Others. Thank you. Thank you thank for your you. testimony. 
Thank you very much. We're moving on to Mark Milano. Starting time. Hi, I'm Mark Milano. I am the lead trainer at the ACREA centers at GMHC, and I've been an HIV trainer since about 1990. I'm also a long-term survivor. I recently noted the 40th anniversary of my AIDS diagnosis on April 12, 1982. And I am here today uh, because of the two words that I wanna speak about, which are self-empowerment. I, I think it's critical that we look at older adults aging with HIV, <clears throat> not as people, not as children who must be taken care of, but as adults, I'm 66 years old. I have 40 years of experience dealing with HIV and I need assistance in taking care of myself rather than in being taken care of by somebody else. In the hundreds of trainings I've given to older adults with HIV, <clears throat> I hear a number of things over and over again, and I wanna share some of those with you. Um, the first thing I hear is so many of us being tired of being reduced to a viral load. So many programs are mainly concerned about, about us being undetectable and looking at us as vectors of viral transmission. So as long as we're undetectable, we're not a threat, and we're one and done. And that's completely misses the point of the things that we, as older adults and long-term survivors, have to deal with. The trauma of living through the 80s or 90s, the huge gaps in our social networks because of all the family and friends that we have lost uh, to date, the comorbidities that we're dealing with, I'm an anal cancer survivor, which was a battle of 14 years that really sapped me. So we need education. We need to learn how to take care of ourselves. Some of the things that we provide at the ACREA centers at GMHC include a series of workshops called I'm Still Here for Long-Term Survivors that talk about all the psychological, physical, uh, and social things that we need to survive. I do a series of webinars called Take Charge of Your Health that helps empower people to become active participants in their healthcare rather than passive consumers. Um, we have uh, the Health Literacy for Older Adults Project, which is funded by Public Health Solutions uh, and the DOH, which does a lot of trainings for older adults and does partner engagement meetings um, between uh, various partners. We have the Brene Bolger uh, Long-Term Survivors Hub. Uh, we have our buddy program. So Time we here are doing everything we can to connect people, to give them the information they need, to empower them to, like the workshop says, take charge of their health and take charge of their life because Giving this away to other people does not lead to good health outcomes. So I encourage uh, the council to be aware of the need for education for older adults with HIV. It's a critical component of our ability to live long, healthy lives. Thanks. Thank you. And we're moving on to Jason Chanchato. Starting time. Good afternoon. Thank you, <clears throat> Chairs Hudson and Combined Committee members for this hearing and opportunity. My name is Jason Sanciato. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the Vice President of Communications and Policy at GMHC, which was founded in 1982 as the world's first HIV and AIDS services organization. Um, uh, over 70,000 New Yorkers living with HIV are aged 50 and older. I'm not going to repeat a lot of the really wonderful and important information shared by others. Uh, I do want to add that a 2018 report by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene revealed that the overall viral suppression rate for New Yorkers over 50 living with HIV was 10% less than that of New York City residents living with HIV overall. Um, put simply, unless the comprehensive needs of older adults living with HIV are addressed, New York City will not uh, end the HIV epidemic, and many older uh, New Yorkers living with HIV will continue to suffer disproportionately, um, as Mark had just shared. Um, community served 
by New York City's HIV service providers and aging services provider overlap more each year, yet these services often remain siloed and absent increased collaboration, um, this growing population will continue to face negative health outcomes. This is why we require whole system approaches and collaborations that will improve the way that health and support services engage with older New Yorkers living with HIV. The New York City Council can lead the way by creating a pilot project for a new citywide HIV and aging initiative, which has been proposed by GMHC and SAGE to, among other things, support increased collaboration and case conferencing between HIV service providers and aging providers, expand industry leading programs and services, combat stigma, and reduce healthcare costs, among other things. The psychosocial programs that this new initiative can support can include culturally competent mental health and substance use treatment, linkage to HIV medical care, multilingual staff and peer navigators, health provider training and education, in-person and virtual social activities to address the social isolation compounded by COVID-19, housing navigation, sexual wellness education, and so much more. These services would be provided and are developed through collaborations between GMHC, SAGE, and other services providers. GMHC and SAGE have proposed that this initiative pilot project be funded at $200,000 in the first year with the potential for subsequent growth pending outcomes. Per the direction and leadership of the council, um, of course, other organizations would be welcome to be a part of the pilot project pending availability and funding. I'll stop there and, and welcome any questions and thanks again. Thank you for your testimony and we're moving on to Judith Ribnick. Starting time. Ine mato manaim, shevetachim kam yachad. Ine mato manaim, shevet kulanu kam yachad. Hello, my name is Judy Ribnick, pronoun she, her. I'm the director of Aging Together at Congregation Beit Simchat Torah, the world's largest LGBTQ synagogue located right here in New York City. Founded in 1973, we are one of New York City's legacy LGBTQIAS plus organizations and will soon enter our 50th year. I sang an excerpt of a well-known hymn, Hine Matov, that states, Hine Matov umanayim, shevet achim, shevet kulanu gam yachad. How good and how pleasant it is all of us to dwell together in community. It's from Psalm 133 and is a guiding principle of our synagogue congregation Beit Simchat Torah, or CBST for short. CBST is a welcoming and safe haven for people of all gender and sexual identities, HIV status, and we're a vibrant spiritual community and progressive voice within Judaism. We champion a Judaism that rejoices in diversity, denounces social injustice wherever it exists and strives for human rights for all people. While CBST has approximately 1,300 members, our doors are open to all. CBST has played a vital role in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people in our community, in this city, and beyond. As an LGBTQIAS plus oriented congregation, we know what it's like to feel marginalized and the inequalities that come to us as a community and also what isolation and loneliness can do for us, can feel like for us as individuals. Certainly COVID has amplified all of these. CBST has risen to the challenge in maintaining a sense of community during COVID and in providing much needed care to individuals, many of whom live alone and are without family. As a social worker focused primarily on supporting older congregants, I can attest to how important it is religious organizations to provide culturally sensitive care to its members and to the broader community. We know that LGBTQIAS elders are often invisible and their needs not considered. Funding that we currently receive from the New York City Council enables us to provide much needed support from professionals as well as creating networks for congregants to support one another during these challenging times as they and we age. We appreciate and applaud the council members and committee's efforts today to address the needs of older LGBTQIAS plus adults in New York City. Indeed, how good and how pleasant it is for all of us to dwell together as community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and thank you panel. We will be moving on to our next panel. Uh, just a reminder that um, 
for panelists, please uh, wait for the queue from the Sergeant at Arms to begin speaking. Um, on our next panel, we have Ellen Amstutz, Jose Albino, Robert Waldron, and Sharon Lowe. Ellen Amstutz, when you're ready, you can begin speaking. Starting time. Okay. Thank you, uh, members of the City Council Aging Committee and Committee on Gender Equity. My name is Ellen Amstutz. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the Senior Program Officer with DeRote. I'm pleased to, uh, to be here today to speak in support of the city's efforts to improve the lives of older New Yorkers, and especially those of our LGBT community of older adults whose needs have been long overlooked. DeRote is a 47-year-old nonprofit organization which works with older adults in Manhattan and beyond. Our mission is to alleviate social isolation and bring generations together. We do this through a range of programs and services that build social connections, create bonds between volunteers, youth, and older adults, and provide supportive services that enable older adults to remain independent and engaged. Our programs bring social connections to seniors in their home, on site, and in the community through a range of virtual and telephone-based programs. This year, we provided services to 3,000 older adults through a network of 5,000 volunteers. Some of the programs that we are most known for is our one-to-one -one programs, such as our Caring Calls, programs which matches seniors for weekly telephone conversations, our friendly visiting in seniors' homes, which cultivate one-to-one -one ongoing friendships between older adults and volunteers, our University Without Walls program, which connects older adults by telephone to group learning programs for those who are not, have not yet crossed the digital divide and still re rely on their telephones for social connections, our group Zoom programming um, and on-site programs, our intergenerational teen programs, which engage youth with older adults for learning activities and camaraderie throughout the school year and during the summer, and our tech coaching program, which provides one-on-one -on -one assistance to older adults who are new to technology to help them gain the skills and comfort with their devices so that they can use them for social connections and getting the things that they need. Why do we do this work? We all know that social isolation is um, a, a serious uh, public health concern. Social isolation is as dangerous as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. It's linked to increased risk of heart disease, stroke, and a 50% increase in dementia. It's expensive. AARP study found that social isolation among older adults is associated with an estimated $6.7 billion in additional Medicare spending annually. Time expired. Social Ellen, you can wrap up really quickly if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we, uh, DeRote has a range of LGBT specific programs because we know this population is at high risk of social, social isolation. Um, and we um, are pleased to be a part of the community providing services to the LGBT older adult population um, and support Sage's recommendation that the New York City Council of the District create a commission specifically to address the needs of LGBT older adults. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're moving on to Jose Albino. Starting time. Good afternoon, all. My name is Jose Albino. I'm the executive director of Rio Circle. So thank you to Council Member Hudson as well as Ron for this opportunity for us to those who have been tested to testify. Real Circle was founded in 1996 by LGBTQ elders of color in order to respond to the social and psychological fragmentation caused by ageism, racism, sexism, homophobia, and poverty in the lives of LGBT elders of color. Our mission is to respond to and eliminate all forms of oppression, including ageism, racism, sexism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, poverty, xenophobia, and their intersections. We achieve this by providing health, wellness, advocacy, and leadership development activities to remove isolation and fear, build community, as well as honor 
racial and ethnic traditions. The organization um, remains the only staff organization in the country exclusively dedicated and designed to serve the needs of LGBTQ elders of color. We serve individuals from 50 years and above. Rio Circle currently serves over 400 registered members across the city, 60% live in Brooklyn. The key organizational programs and services include leadership development opportunities, buddy to buddy peer caregiver program, case management, health and wellness, community training, peer led support groups, and nutritional lunches. While GRIO has been providing services in Brooklyn for over 25 years, it does not receive any federal, state, city, or contract, or, or federal, state, or city contract dollars. This includes a recent older adults RFP put out by the DIFTA. The organization survived via discretionary dollars that are given by selected council members, private foundations, and support from individual donors that center intersection of justice in their giving patterns and priorities. Coupled with the aforementioned, GRIO recently faced the biggest challenges yet earlier this year when it became necessary to move out of the office and program a space that it occupied for more than a decade in kind by the New York City Office of Mental Health. GRIO has continued to provide critical support to its members and continues to operationalize a strategic plan centered on a sustainable fundraising plan that would enable the organization to find GRIO a permanent space as well as allow it to provide the highest levels of service to its member members. We are currently is continuing to offer online classes, meal provision, and limited safe in-person health and wellness classes at Sage Stonewall in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. Sage is providing GRIO a temporary space at the site twice a week. As a nonprofit leader who has been doing this work in the AG space for 25 years, what I need you to know is that no nonprofit organization in this city or in this country will survive, let alone thrive, without the investment of public dollars. Rio has provided, has proved by being here Time expired. In, August, in August, celebrating its 26 years, that is able to sustain itself by appealing to and receiving the support of private foundations and individual donors. Without the equitable investment from the city council body, Grio's future is compromised, which means the pipeline to supportive services to BIPOC older adults will be insanely compromised. Many do not and will not be willing to receive services from organizations that they may deem unsafe and do not affirm their, identi their intersectional identity. We can continue to fight this fight alone. We usher in Pride Weekend. My ask of this body is to invest more public dollars and do more for the LGBTQIA plus older adults of color and to lift and amplify the contributions to the queer movement because they built it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to Robert Waldron. Starting time. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for having me. My name is Robert Waldron. I'm a part of Greer Circle. I've been a part of Greer Circle for the last 15 years. Sorry you cannot see me because I'm not home. I was looking for a place that I would be comfortable as a gay man. I became a member of Greer Circle and I'm there for over 15 years. I volunteer my service, and I do a support group on services for men over 65 living with HIV. I'm also HIV positive. Greer Circle has been very, very good and welcoming to me when I started out there. I was living HIV and I didn't want people to know. But finally, Mr. Albino, God bless him, we got together, we decided that I had to do something to put my story out there. We put our story together, two other guys and myself. We were able to go to senior centers, speak to the seniors, uh, we met seniors who are from the LGBT community who are afraid so they have no space to share their lives with. It's hard to find a community that welcomes you as 
uh, black, Caribbean, American, and I'm from the Caribbean. I love the space of Queer Circle. It empowers us. We have a system called the Budget to Body System. We reach out to members who are not able to come to our meetings or, or gatherings, but we reach out to them to let them know we are here for them. We still care for them. And especially when they're single and have no one to sit and talk with. Career Circle has empowered me to be who I am. And founder of Career Circle, Regina Shavers, God bless her for founding this space for people of color. We do hope that Greer Circle will be here for another 25 years and more. And the council members, please, please help us to stay alive. Time expired. Thank you for giving me the time and happy pride. Thank you very much. And we're moving on to Sharon Lowe. Starting time. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Chairpersons Caban, Hudson, and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity and the Committee on Aging. My name is Sharon Lowe. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent, thank you. My name is Sharon Lowe. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I serve as a behavioral health provider at Callan Lord Community Health Center. Callan Lord provides services focused on New York City's LGBTQIA plus communities while remaining welcoming to all regardless of ability to pay. Callan Lord serves as an affirming environment for patients seeking culturally competent care who are over from over uh, 195 zip codes across the five boroughs in New York City. According to Webster's Dictionary, the word closet has a definition as a noun, a state of condition of secrecy, privacy, or obscurity. Just by definition alone, being in the closet is not a healthy place to be. It can have a significant impact on one's overall health and navigating through the world. I reference this word because of our LGBTQ plus elders fought so hard to come out of the proverbial closet only to have to return time after time when they are unable to receive affirming care within our healthcare system. Without affirming healthcare systems that address the unique needs of our LGBTQIA plus elders, they are forced to put off seeking help. When this is the only choice left, we are forcing them to a state of to disassociate. And what exactly does that mean? Whenever there is a traumatic event that happens to someone, they tend to disassociate from the event. And that's just them protecting themselves. I have stories from our LGBTQIA elders who have stated they have been misgendered assumptions were made about them or healthcare providers ignore them. Numerous times I hear stories of these mis these microaggressive acts where our LGBTQIA plus elders are being demoralized, judged, and treated less than human beings. These negative experiences only serve to, conf to conform why so many LGBTQ elders put off seeking help from our healthcare system. There needs to be a built-in partnership between our healthcare system and how the system addresses these unique needs for the LGBTQIA plus elders without forcing them back into the closet. LGBTQ elders should have to be, should not have to be exposed to undue harm in the process of seeking Time care expired. from professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will be moving on to our next panel. Um, our next panel will be uh, Brianna Payton Williams, Catherine Thurston, Dr. Cynthia Moore, and Peter Kempner. And just a reminder to our panelists to wait for the cue from the Sergeant at Arms to begin speaking. Um, up first is Brianna Payton Williams. 
starting time. Hello, I'm Brianna Peyton Williams, the Communications and Policy Associate at Livon, New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Live on New York's members include more than 110 nonprofit organizations that provide core services to older New Yorkers to ensure they have the services they need to age in place. In New York City, LGBTQIA plus older adults are the pioneers of the pride movement who stood at Stonewall and paved the way for the younger generation. Yet many older New Yorkers, um, many uh, older New Yorkers, excuse me, refuse to be invisible yet face unique and serious obstacles as they age with many older New Yorkers facing years of stigma and discrimination throughout their lives. Too often, older people have thinner support systems, creating a growing demand for LGBTQI plus affirming community-based services and care, including affirming housing developments, healthcare services, and community-based services. Community-based uh, organizations, including a number of our members who have testified today, including SAGE, um, Queens Community House, and Deloitte, are trusted sources for older adults and provide critical services for LGBTQI plus people, yet the city can do more to support LGBTQI plus older adults and fund services that address the disparities impacting older adults, including LGBT older adults. To create a city that supports all New Yorkers, the city must make long-term investments in older adults and community-based services that support LGBTQI plus older adults and empower and uplift a community that for too long has been invisible. Live on New York recommends the following. First, the, the city should ensure that LGBTQI plus competent aging services are offered in a culturally and linguistically competent manner that better reaches LGBT older adults, including communities of color. And due to the thinner networks, many older adults rely on community-based services to access critical support. We also recommend that the city should continue to support new models of service, including the grab-and-go meals. It is evident that these new models like grab-and-go were critical and successful in ensuring older adults, including LGBT older adults who may not be able to attend in person and congregate meals or are just not uncomfortable or comfortable with attending in person or for whatever, whatever reason they may have um, to have the option to take their meal home, a decision that ensures that no one's nutritional needs um, can be met in the environment of one's choosing. We also recommend the city expands competent mental health services for older adults to combat loneliness, depression, and anxiety. We also recommend that the city expands access to affordable housing. Across the city, older adults face difficulties in finding affordable housing with rising rent costs and over half of older adults are rent burdened, spending more than 30% of their income on rent. We recommend that the city allocates funding to develop 1,000 units of affordable housing each year, in addition to increasing the reimbursement rate for the SARE services, so from 5,000 per unit to 7,500 uh, per unit. But in particular, the city Time must expired. double down on its commitment to provide affordable housing for the LGBT community. Um, lastly, uh, we strongly support Councilmember Hudson and Councilmember Caban's new legislation to establish a commission on the LGBTQI plus older adults within the DIFTA. Uh, more information can be found in our written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. Moving on to Catherine Thurston. Starting time. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Catherine Thurston, and I'm the Chief Program Officer at Service Program for Older People, or SPOP. SPOP is the only agency in New York City exclusively dedicated to community-based mental health services for older adults. Our agency offers services via telehealth and in person at our Manhattan offices and 19 satellite locations throughout Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn, and the Bronx. We serve over 2,000 adults annually and provide individual and group therapy, psychiatry, medication management, specialized counseling for substance use disorders, and linkages to other community-based services to support aging in place. Central to our mission is a commitment to eliminate barriers to care, and our foundational program model is based on bringing mental health services to where older adults live, gather, and socialize. Whether through co-locating licensed mental health clinics within older adult centers, treating clients in their homes, or partnering with faith-based groups or public libraries to address stigma, we recognize that creative solutions make a difference. Six years ago, SPOP and SAGE worked together to create the first LGBTQ plus older adult mental health clinic in New York City, located at the E.D. Windsor SAGE Center in Manhattan. 
recognizing that LGBTQ plus older adults evidence behavioral health challenges at higher rates than their cohorts and are historically mistrustful of the mental health profession and therefore far less likely to reach out for help, SPOT provides LGBTQ plus affirming mental health care, medication management, and other services to ensure that any older adult who walks into a SAGE center can receive mental health support in addition to all the wonderful programs SAGE has to offer. The idea of a no wrong door for our most vulnerable populations is a critical piece of expanding access to good care and to building community. In this last year, we have opened a second licensed clinic at Sage's Cortona Pride House in the Bronx and are already at full capacity, demonstrating once again, the enormity of the need for behavioral health support. SPOT would also like to applaud the recent proposed legislation that would enable the New York City Department for the Aging to create and implement a commission specifically focused on the needs of LGBTQ plus older adults. And we would hope that such a commission would include the older adults themselves, as well as subject matter experts who have demonstrated their commitment and competency to the community of LGBTQ plus elders. I'd like to thank Chairpersons Hassan and Kaban and the members of the Committee on Aging and Committee on Women and Gender Equity for your support and your work on behalf of older New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're moving on to Dr. Cynthia Moore. Starting time. Happy Pride. Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony. My name is Dr. Cynthia Maurer. I'm the Executive Director of Visiting Neighbors, and we're now in our 50th year of providing support services that help senior 62 centenarian plus. And actually, uh, we work with the predominantly with the oldest old population, which is 85 plus. The average age of our client is 89. And we are definitely graying as the um, years go by. Uh, 10 years ago, the average age was 79. Uh, now it is 89. And we have 100-year-olds that are coming in for the first time services. Our humble beginning started in the Greenwich Village in 1972, and we continued with the concept of neighbors helping neighbors. We have always embraced inclusivity for not only the seniors, the volunteers, and the student interns. Um, we really are about here what is the what is what makes you you, and we open we open uh, our arms and our hearts. Um, we find that for us, the population that um, we work with, a lot of our seniors are very quiet. We've heard that said today. We see that all the time. And they're not necessarily um, comfortable, the LGBTQIA plus population, spelling out who they are or where they are come from or what their interests are. But we, because of the nature of our intimate uh, programs, we get to know our people very, very well and create a safe space where they feel loved, respected, and accepted. Um, Maya Angelou would say, do the best you can until you know better, and then when you know better, do better. And we're learning and teaching ourselves all the time as an agency. Um, we are here to advocate for all of our seniors and keep them at home and be able to say, we welcome you with open arms and it's very important to recognize that there are some organizations that serve all seniors that are on the front lines like ours we were open and active and providing direct services right out of our offices throughout the pandemic full-time and we are here to continue to do so um, we are thanking you so much for the opportunity to speak today, and we want you to know we will do whatever we can and want to be allies and friends to our neighbors, to our seniors, and be able to serve in any way we can. Um, we are all about acceptance and support and be who you are. And in time, people do share this information. So we do have some data on that. Um, but again, we're learning as well, and this is a population that chooses to stay quiet about themselves. Um, to end in a quote with um, that was said uh, by um, Dr. Cornell West. Time expired. You can't, you can't save the people if you don't serve the people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and then we're moving on to Peter Kempner. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Pierre Kempner, pronouns he, him, 
and I'm the legal director and senior law project director at Volunteers of Legal Service, also known as VALS. The VALS Senior Law Project serves low-income New Yorkers age 60 and over, primarily by providing last wills and testaments, powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, and other essential advanced directives free of charge. These life planning documents enable our clients to properly prepare for possible incapacity and death. They allow our clients to maintain income and avoid homelessness, ensure that their dying wishes are fulfilled, and empower our clients, caregivers, to obtain services necessary for our clients to access health care and age in place. We strongly believe that all older adults should have the right documents in place as they plan for the future, but we have several initiatives that focus on vulnerable subsets of the older adult population. These include veterans, Spanish-speaking seniors, older women, and LGBTQIA plus seniors. We've created these initiatives because, because we know it is important to deliver culturally competent services that are tailored to the communities we seek to serve. We specifically target services to LGBTQIA plus older adults because of the unique challenges they face as they age. Despite the US Supreme Court's decision in 2015 upholding marriage equality, this does not mean that these older adults are, similar, are now similarly situated to their heterosexual peers. As a population, they're twice as likely to live, as, uh, live alone as their straight counterparts, and they're also four times less likely to have had children. As we age, family members are often step in as caregivers, and the importance of planning for the future becomes amplified when those traditional caregiving structures are not present. Because medical decision-making defaults to blood relatives, unless a patient has completed an advanced directive, people who are estranged from their families may not have their wishes followed. In New York State, the Family Health Care Decisions Act lays out a hierarchical structure of who could step in to make health care decisions if the principal is unable to make those decisions themselves. While chosen family members or close friends, as defined by the statute, may be able to step in to make critical decisions, their ability to do so is subservient to spouses, domestic partners, parents, children, and siblings. A close friend may only exercise decision-making ability after presenting a signed statement to an attending physician that they maintain regular contact with the patient as to be familiar with the patient's activities, health, and religious or moral beliefs. These statutory requirements are clearly a burden when a loved one is facing a medical crisis. No one's partner should have to prepare a signed statement in order to get access to and make decisions on behalf of their loved one, especially when a blood relative has the authority to step Time in expired. and veto that ability. We prepare these healthcare proxies and other advanced directives for our LGBTQIA plus older adults clients to ensure that their families they choose are able to make decisions for them. Um, I have fuller testimony that I'll, we will be submitting, but I'd also like to end by saying that um, the creation of a commission to identify challenges, share best practices, and develop expert recommendations on ways to improve the quality of life of LGBTQIA older adults is a laudable endeavor and one that could only serve to improve the lives of New Yorkers as they age. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, just noting that we are moving on now to our last panel. Um, and our last panel will consist of Adina Wayne and Lisa Santiago. And just a reminder to um, those testifying to wait for the Sergeant at Arms to call. So now we have Adina Wayne. Starting time. Good afternoon. Thank you to Chairs Hudson and Caban for holding this important hearing. My name is Adina Wayne, and I'm a staff attorney for the LGBTQ Law Project at the New York Legal Assistance Group, or NILAG. Our office provides free legal services and advocacy to low-income LGBTQ communities throughout New York City. We work to defend and expand the rights of New York City's LGBTQ community and offer legal advice and representation in a wide variety of poverty-related civil legal matters. On behalf of NILAG, I'm here to offer our strong support for increased services and resources for LGBTQ older adults. At NILAG, one of our main areas of focus is advanced directives for older LGBTQ adults. LGBTQ elders' family structures are often non-traditional, making advanced directives such as wills, healthcare proxies, and powers of attorney exceptionally important. 
Older LGBTQ adults who pass away without a last will and testament in place may leave their possessions to estranged family members who have rejected them and their identities, rather than to their loved ones who are not recognized as their legal heirs. Should they fall ill and become incapacitated, their sibling they have not spoken to in 40 years may be the one making medical decisions, rather than their life partner of 30 years. Those without partners may wish for their chosen family to make such end-of-life decisions, rather than their family of origin. For instance, during the height of the pandemic, Nylag received a phone call from a grieving older gay man whose partner of almost 50 years had recently passed. They had never desired to get married and had maintained separate residences, though they spent most of their time at his partner's apartment. As a result, their relationship held no legal status when his partner died without a will. He was immediately locked out of his partner's apartment, where many of his belongings remained. He learned that his partner's possessions now belonged to his partner's nieces and nephews, who lived in Georgia. When he tried to follow through with his partner's wishes to be cremated, the funeral told him that the funeral home told him that his partner's next of kin, the nieces and nephews thousands of miles away, would need to give consent first. And the story is not unique. Many older LGBTQ adults, particularly those living in poverty and without easy access to legal advice, pass away without crucial advance directives in place. Such directives can ensure that their wishes are respected should they become ill and that their chosen family is taken care of after their passing. Yet despite the increased need for advanced L directives for LGBTQ older adults as compared to their non-LGBTQ LGBTQ counterparts, it is frequently more challenging for LGBTQ elders to access these crucial, crucial legal services. Moreover, compared to aging non-LGBTQ people, older LGBTQ adults are far less likely to rely on adult children and other family members for caregiving. LGBTQ older adults' family structures frequently look different from those of straight cisgender elders. Many LGBTQ older people experience social isolation. More than 50% of LGBTQ older adults have reported feeling isolated from others. Because LGBTQ older adults may rely on other members in their community Time and in expired. their age group, uh, many do not have people in their lives that can care for them as they age. Thank you very much. I am also submitting a longer written testimony. Thank you very much. And moving on to Lisa Santiago. Starting time. Hi, and thank you for this opportunity to talk as a part of your hearing as a panelist for the Committee on Aging. Uh, my name is Lisa Santiago, and I work at Sunrise at East 56. What we wanted to address today is how valuable our relationship with SAGE is and how to br help bring awareness that there are very specific needs uh, as seniors age, um, specifically the LGBTQ plus community. As a senior service organization, specifically assisted living and memory care services, providing care in one of the largest cities in the world, it was so important for us to incorporate training and development programs to reflect the diverse city that we live and work in. I am not personally a member of the LGBTQ plus community, but I do have family and friends who are, and I also work with seniors and have been doing so for almost 12 years. What I've learned and continue to learn is that seniors have varying needs and there's not one sized approach to caring for a senior as they age. So for us, partnering with an organization like SAGE and training our frontline staff has been a huge education in the senior living space. There are still so many stigmas that exist today. One of the, thing we really, one of the things we really wanted to learn and instill in our staff as a community with a healthcare component is how to be in tune with our residents' needs. Meeting them where they are in the aging process really needs to be parallel to the offerings of our residents in the city. We need to challenge our assumptions of what seniors want by providing for their needs in a dignified way. How do we help seniors, which I would say are one of the more vulnerable populations without truly understanding their needs? In order to do that, we need to do that without judgment in open conversations without censorship. By utilizing our partnerships in the community, such as SAGE, we can continue to address needs with an awareness on approach so we can be culturally competent. It is a sad thing for me to think that the challenges and discriminations that people face when they are younger are often worsened through the aging process. 
The reality is that many of the individuals in the LGBTQ plus community do not have a support system in place and can become extremely isolated as, they res as a result as they age. Before I close, I would like to share a personal story that my paternal grandparents both had dementia, most likely Alzheimer's, my maternal grandmother had a stroke and my grandfather had dementia. And thankfully, my family has a big support system. There were family members that were able to step in and help. Now imagine that you do not have that support system and are struggling with physical or cognitive issues. What are your choices? What do you do? Having resources like SAGE offers the LGBTQ plus community more choices, less isolation for seniors, and a lot of the training and support in their community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, this concludes our public testimony. Because this is a hybrid hearing, if you are on Zoom and your name has not been called and you still wish to testify, uh, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands, turning it over to Chair Hudson. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone who has provided testimony today. Um, you know, on behalf of myself and council member and chair Caban, um, I'd like to just say thank you again. Chair Caban has been actively engaged, though she couldn't actively participate the whole time due to uh, the open meetings law at the state level. So I just wanted to, to share that. You know, we're at a time right now where, particularly in the city council, we're still experiencing not just words um, and also acts of homophobia and transphobia, uh, but actions from our colleagues um, who have made it clear, you know, that uh, not everybody is, is welcomed and accepted. Um, here in New York, and obviously those of us who are here today and, and all of you who have testified today uh, know differently and know that New York City is a place uh, where all are welcome. Um, but the idea that here in the City Council we're still facing such remarks, especially during Pride, is unsettling to say the least. Um, there are folks who were around in the 1970s and also through the AIDS and HIV crisis in the 1980s that are still here, um, that we're lucky to have here, that are doing well and thriving, and we need to show them the respect and the dignity that they deserve across housing, health care, and all services and resources that are needed. We've heard here today that so many members of the LGBTQIA plus community are less likely to have family support, less likely to have children. We don't have the data, uh, and we aren't, frankly, centering or prioritizing this community uh, as a city and, and culturally. And so I think creating a specific commission to address the needs of older LGBT, GNC, non-binary, and queer folks is clearly needed, and we've heard so much about that today. So I just want to thank, again, everyone who's provided testimony. Uh, thank the commissioner for being here with us today. Thank you to Chair Caban. Thank you to all the staff, the committee staff, for both uh, the Women and Gender Equity Committee and also the Committee on Aging. Uh, and thank you, and happy Pride. And I'm gaveling us out. <laughs>